Good morning, everyone. I'd like to ask you at this time to please check your mobile phones as I just checked mine and turned it off. Please be sure that all your mobile phones are off. Please do that. Participants, um, parents, coaches, yes. Uh, one quick note, judges who have not submitted their critique sheets, this is very, very important for all of the participants. Would you please return the critique sheets to room 231 before noon today? I'd like to find out exactly which schools are here right now. I know we have some delays. American Community Schools, are you here? <laughs> Anatolia College. Perhaps they're still having their coffee outside. Arsakia School of Patras. Arsakia, are you here? No. Not yet. Campion School. <laughs> Costas Gitana School. They'll be here. Epidemic and Agenisi. Gitana School. <laughs> Hellenic American Educational Foundation. <laughs> Manjulidi School, the Moraiti School, Pierce American College of Peace, Pinewood American International School, St. Catherine's British School, St. Catherine's, St. Lawrence College, the Third General Lyceum Paleo Fadero, are you here? I'd like to remind you all that today's events will be live streamed at anatolia.edu.gr slash live. It is very important that there is no movement during each of the performances, between the performances. Please stay seated out of courtesy for the performers. If you need to use the restrooms, they are located at the back, below the bleachers, at the back of the gym. Um, I think we can begin. <laughs> Ms. Kostopoulos. Let's begin now with original oratory. Could I ask the judges please to take your seats? And could I ask for, oral, for original oratory, Ms. Georgia Magnatis from Pierce, American College of Greece, to present the, present the finalists. Good morning. Congratulations to all the participants. Now, the finalists are, first, from Hayek, Vasiliki Papazopoulou, 198. that interferes with my learning is my education, said Albert Einstein. You know, as a student in a Greek high school, I would have to agree. I think that most students in their final years of high school, be it Panhellenic, VIB, GCEs, APs, in whatever system, will find similar complaints. Whatever the system, we constantly hear about how terrible the state of education is. Our reality? We memorize a plethora of useless facts and spit them back just so we can get the grades we need to get into university. We narrow down our creativity and critical thinking to get the numbers we need to become doctors, lawyers, engineers. The goal of education is no longer thinking, but simply achieving. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, I am done ranting. And since complaining never gets us anywhere, I'm going to tell you what I think we should do about it. 
Although what I'm saying may at times seem Greek-centric, as this is my reality, I think that many of the solutions I propose can be applied to the universal problems with education. Basically, education is not working. And as Ken Robinson notes, reform to a system that is broken does nothing. So what we need, ladies and gentlemen, is an educational revolution. This is not going to be easy. Revolution never is. My proposals will be met with skepticism, not only by those in power, but also by parents and even some teachers who will tell me that it worked for them, so why change it? And to those people, I would say, has it really? When you entered the world, were you ready? And did it look like our world today? We need a system that is right for our context, not the current system, created, as Robinson points out, to meet the needs of industrialization. Our needs have changed. Memorizing may once have been important, but today we have everything at our fingertips, and so we need to learn how to find and use information instead of learning to be parrots. We need to learn to be critical and creative thinkers who know what questions to ask rather than what page the answer is on. Most of all, we need to learn to be more responsible for our education. So how are we going to achieve these lofty goals? My first step in the educational revolution would be to get away from the idea that a number can be used to indicate my learning. I know this is unrealistic, but we have to find a way to make sure that behind those numbers, there are people who are capable of helping us progress in the future. Eventually, what we need is something like Professor Dylan Williams' idea of assessment for learning, rather than assessment of learning. Student work would be commented on by teachers, and students would thirst for the advice on how to improve. The number would be secondary. This is what actually we really need in order to have true education. It's unrealistic today, but maybe not in the future, if we make some radical changes in general. Okay, since we probably aren't ready to have assessment change just yet, let's make a smaller start. Who are the people who determine what I should learn? I often get the feeling that those making these crucial decisions are very out of touch with today's students and reality. This is why I think that we need student voice in the Ministry of Education. We need to have a say in what and how we learn. Let me give you an example. Last year, a new class was introduced to Greek high schools called Research Project. Twenty students have a common topic, which they divide into subtopics, and working as a team, they carry out research, all organized and completed by the students. What a great idea, in theory. Now, let's look at what really happens. The good students do all the work, while resentment grows for those who don't care but ride along and get a decent grade. Is this education? What if, before implementing yet another reform, the ministry had asked students for input? Maybe we could tell them what we need, how we think this could actually work. I have lots of ideas, but who am I to tell them? Well, I'm the one who's supposed to be learning from this. Now, the next step in the educational revolution would be the fact that we need to move away from centralization of education. In Greece, absolutely everything is controlled by the ministry. What we learn, when we learn it, what books we use, and how we use them. This would mean that all teachers can teach the same way, and that all students can learn the same way. This is ridiculous. There can still be a centralized curriculum what students should have learned in order to move to the next level. There can be exam criteria, but why can schools be given the freedom to meet the needs of their students as they see fit? Why can schools decide how the teachers and students will approach material? If we allowed schools, teachers, and students to make decisions regarding curriculum, then I guarantee that education will improve, and we will have true education. 
I'm pretty sure that in this revolution, we will not stand alone. We will have the teachers on our side. Most teachers are people committed to learning. Look at the fact that you teachers are here. We need all teachers to be willing to teach us something that will not be assessed in an exam, like forensics. So we need to give teachers the time and the opportunity to get properly trained in anything they think will help students. So if more time were spent helping teachers to be great and less time spent throwing more reforms at the system, then we would have true education. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, there are problems in the way education is approached around the world. Look, I am not naive enough to think that there is a panacea for the problems we're facing. I think that this revolution, like all revolutions, would face resistance. But what is the alternative? Do we accept the status quo? Do we accept the fundamentally flawed system? I say no. I say, let's start an educational revolution. Unfortunately for me, you'll have to wait a bit, because after this tournament, I have to go home and memorize my history book so that in June I can tell you what's on page 23, paragraph 2, so that I can get into law school. Thank you very much. So, Mora it is, Sanos Dukakis. Globalization, communication, information, transportation, technology, exchange, innovation, and democracy. These are some of the terms used to label human society during the 20th and 21st century. It is without doubt true that we have come a very long way and that we have brought about serious change, both for the better and for the worse. In the light of the world economic crisis and the Arab Spring, however, when the masks come off and playtime is over, a fairly educated citizen of the West may wonder whether he or she has been living in a virtual reality all along. With more than one billion people living in city slums today, with 400,000 slain in the Darfur genocide, one cannot help but raise the following question. Was and is democracy real? Some people will gasp at this question, pointing to the sacrifices and colossal struggles that have been made throughout history to achieve democracy. Others will frown at its seemingly cynical tone. After all, democracy is being able to publish an article stating your opinion freely. It's an Anglo-Saxon and an African-American getting married. It's a sick construction worker having access to free public health care. It's even me being able to criticize this institution through my speech. And all this is really wonderful. It really is. But at some point, we need to take a step back and face the facts. To begin with, we all know that democracy was founded around 500 BC in ancient Greece, Athens, and all citizens could vote. But 
there is a small complication to this all. The title of citizen was only granted to a free adult, male, born in Athens, and of two Athenian parents, women, slaves, immigrants, merchants, and even men of one Athenian parent did not have the right to vote. It goes without saying that these pedigree Athenians constituted a minority of the population, representing a mere 30%. Therefore, what I'm trying to get at is that, unlike what most of us may think of democracy as a pure entity that sprouted out of nowhere, that is not the case. Democracy didn't simply appear among science and the arts and culture and the zenith of ancient Greece. At the time, Aristotle stated that democracy is when the indigent and not the men of property are the rulers. But even if that was the case back then, which is arguable, it does not seem to be the case nowadays. As a matter of fact, 20% of the world's population accounts for 75% of total private consumption. At the same time, the wealthiest nation on earth has the widest gap between rich and poor while less than 1% of what the world spent every year on weapons was needed to put every child into school in the last decade. Weapons and education, ladies and gentlemen. You can do the math. Consider that 50% of the world's population is not included in this democracy, let alone possesses or is even aware of its fundamental human rights. Is it democracy when there are 24 million human slaves in the world today used as sex slaves or for labor? Yes, 24 million human souls. I think not. So, at the same time, uh, the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, had stated that, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. However, human trafficking is at its peak at the moment with cases from Indonesia and Mali to California and Switzerland. However, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the fundamental pillar of democracy, states that no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Consider this. There are more slaves today than there have ever been before in human history. In case you didn't catch that, 24 million. How is that a democracy? How can we call ourselves citizens of a democracy when our 21st century society is based on 24 million enslaved souls? But let's take the democratic world and its so-called civil society with parliaments and elections in the sort. In the 2012 USA presidential elections, 61 million citizens voted for the Republican nominee, Mitt Romney, and 65 million voted for the Democrat and already President of the United States, Barack Obama. If we do the math, we can figure out that the presidency of one of the most powerful states in the world was decided on a mere 3.5% difference. Now, I don't mean to complain, but is that really representation of majority, or is just your luck in numbers? If we take a look at the dictionary, it says that democracy is the rule of the majority. Why is it then that the five largest weapon producers in the world, the USA, UK, France, China, and Russia, have the ability to stop any decision being made by the 193 member states of the United Nations by simply vetoing it? How is that democracy? What is even more troubling than that? is that France, the UK, and USA combined consist of approximately 450 citizens, million citizens, excuse me, whereas India alone consists of 1.22 billion. Somehow, India cannot have the veto power or have a decisive say on the world's decisions. I wonder why. And at the same time, how does democracy really apply today when it invites people to question it? In Greece, 7% of the population voted for an extremist, neo-Nazi party, which now properly holds seats in parliament. In the French 2012 presidential elections, 7 million citizens voted for the nationalist, far-right-wing candidate. The way it works today, democracy has been calling upon ideologies that contradicted to play a bigger role in decision-making, 
and this will definitely not benefit anyone, and especially our so-called democracies. But this speech does not aim to terrorize or scold humanity. Yet as Gandhi stated, what difference does it make to the dead, to the orphans, or to the homeless, whether the mad destruction is wrought under the name of totalitarianism or under the holy name of liberty or democracy? Ladies and gentlemen, it is evident that this destruction is taking place. Poverty, war, disease, or omnipresence. It is also evident that the world is changing at an increasing rate. And this change could be towards a decisive reform and restructuring of the democratic state, or a switch from democracy to a new political system. The outcome is up to us. But whatever the case, some of us are still equipped with what is possibly the greatest weapon ever granted its citizens. It is greater than any bullet or gun or missile or bomb. It is a right, it is a responsibility, and it is a privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the right to vote. So use your critical thinking, educate yourselves, investigate, question, and most of all, exercise your right to vote, and exercise it in an informed, conscious manner. As the saying goes, the only thing certain is change, and you have been given the right to shape it. Thank you. Thank you, Thanos. The next finalist is from Pierce, Anna Sulele, number 140. Simplify, simplify, simplify. This is what Henry David Thoreau wrote in his book Waldman almost 150 years ago. And I'm pretty sure that this is what he'd screamed if he was transported to the 21st century and saw how we live. The big question here is, how can we adapt a 19th century idea to our materialistic way of life? Well, I'll tell you. But first, imagine that you've lost your job. As a result, you have no money to pay the bills, no money to pay the rent. On top of all that, you've been thrown out of your house. What do you do? What's next? I think we're all aware of the fact that this is not an imaginary scenario. It is here and now, ladies and gentlemen. In these times of financial crisis and disintegration, as we are facing today, people often become depressed, desperate, and even suicidal. We need inspiration and new ideas to lead us through the crisis. Thankfully, inspiration has been found. There is a way out, ladies and gentlemen. There is a trend all around the world of a new way of life. A life without money. A life based on sharing goods. A life of creativity and minimal consumption. Sounds crazy, maybe even utopian. Keep in mind the magic word of Thoreau, simplify. And join me on a journey where you'll find out that life without money is arguably what will help many people emerge from their dead end. Moving a little back in time, in 2009, 13,000 Brits lost their homes. 
But these people did not become depressed, desperate, or suicidal. A group of them occupied a section of urban land in Bradford and founded an eco-village. Eco-villages are organized, environmentally friendly communities. The residents live in self-built houses that are built of recycled materials. Instead of shopping, they go skipping, which means that they pick up all of the food supermarkets throw away. They also grow some vegetables of their own. It is true that these people do not live comfortable lives. However, they have found courage, inspiration, and companionship. This courage has helped them survive, and thanks to that, they now live decently through sharing. That scenario did not just occur to British people. From 1981 to 2002, Argentina was sucked into a terrible economic crisis. In the case of Argentina, I have to note that I'm not just talking about people losing their houses, but about a whole nation dying of hunger in the streets with no ray of hope in the future. And even these people did not give up. They had a brilliant idea. Troika. This was the first step for citizens to become economically independent from government. They created a space where people took their products, only that instead of selling them, they exchanged them. In order for this exchange to be official, there were coupons on which the trade was based. What this meant is that in order to buy something, you needed a specific amount of coupons which you will have earned by offering something else. As this something did not have to be material, it could be a service. Dentists, doctors, notaries, they all survived thanks to Troika and did not give up their profession. Troika was the place where one million people found refuge during the crisis. It worked for a large number of people. It is a fact that cannot be doubted. How then can life without money be doubted? A German woman named Heide Marie Schwemmer has been living without money for the past 15 years. She has no house and all of her belongings can be found in a single suitcase. She takes care of people's houses when they're away, and in return, they give her food and a place to sleep at night. Her new way of living is based on an original way of thinking that we should share. She wants to remind us that values are not hidden in material goods, but in our minds and our hearts. These examples probably seem extreme to you, but in order to adopt these new ideas in our everyday lives, all we need to do is take one step at a time. First, and the hardest step of all, is to change our way of thinking. Don't neglect the fact that our society is not only facing an economic crisis, but a severe crisis of values and moral rectitude as well, which are even harder to overcome. It's time we made a start, though. We have to stop evaluating people by their affluence. We have to stop exploiting our fellow citizens in order to gain financial wealth and power. Then the second step we need to take is an exchange of products and services. This has already started in Mag through the internet. In Magnesia, citizens have organized a program, similar to Troike, with which they sell their products, only that instead of receiving money, they gain camps, which are the alternative means of the trade. What if I told you that this could be even simpler? Nowadays, groups of friends, especially in our country, organize social gatherings in order to exchange clothes. Money is not the only way to refresh our style, which we very often get bored of. Imagine getting together with your friends, receiving advice for what suits you or not, or having your friend's beautiful sweater you've always desired. And all that, in your living room, laughing and enjoying the company of the people you love. So the next time you'll feel the need to go shopping, think how miserable you'll be looking at shop windows and thinking that you could never possibly afford a fancy suit or a dress. Then think again and compare it with the scenes I've just described. You will see that it is in your hands in our hands to find ideas, come up with solutions, and discover happiness. Where there is a will, there is a way. And thus, solutions never end. Recently in Greece, groups of people offered their expertise to socially deprived citizens. More specifically, a group of teachers is offering free lessons through the internet. The Hellenic Medical Society is offering medical services to poor and uninsured people. What do they have to gain? Money? Definitely not. Have we forgotten the personal satisfaction and fulfillment gained when helping a fellow citizen? Isn't that more important than money? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a trend spreading all around the world. People have stopped being passive and have tried to find ways to react. They have been the change they wanted to see in the world. However extreme, it is a start. It is the start. And we can join in. By changing our way of thinking, 
exchanging products and services so that we become self-sufficient and reduce the use of money tremendously. In this way, we will again discover the true essence of life, reaching out for each other. This is where a little journey ends. Thoreau was right. Simplify. It can and it has to be put into practice. Life without money can happen, has happened, and must happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Our next finalist is from Mandulidis, Christina Taratori, number 104. Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. Many years ago, a humble man called Martin Luther King had a dream that Caucasians and African Americans would be equal, have the same rights, receive the same treatment, and mankind would be united as one. And after many years, that dream is close to coming true. Although discrimination against minorities is still a societal issue, we have come a long way since Martin Luther King. I also have a dream that one day people with disabilities will be treated like you and you and you are treated as normal human beings. 17 years ago, I was born with a disability called achondroplasia. It's a kind of dwarfism, as you can see. When the doctor came out to announce my birth to my parents, he said these words verbatim. Don't treat it bad. I know it's hard to love it, but it's your child. Oh yes, those words came out of a doctor's mouth. A man of science who has been exposed to so many cases like mine. At that moment, my mother thought that perhaps the doctor needed a high five with a chair on his face. <laughs> Not only do my parents love me, but they have treated me exactly the same as my brother and sister. I have been swimming professionally for the last 13 years. I have taken ballet classes, and I'm currently living my life as any normal teenager would. One might even claim that it's more of a disability to be tall than short. I have no problem fitting into airplane toilets or to cut in line my school cafeteria because no one notices me. But why is it so difficult to love a child with a disability? Is it a matter of height? Or the fact that one is stranded in a wheelchair for life? Seven um, Every day, when walking down the street, you encounter various people. You see them, and you move on. They belong in the category that one might label as normal. Now, imagine that for one day, you or a family member developed a disability. What if for one day, you found yourself transformed into a different being, much like in Friends Kafka's Metamorphosis? How would that make you feel? Let me tell you how that would be. People would stare at you and gossip. Let me present to you some of the most common looks and reactions when one encounters people that are visibly irregular in some way. First, it's the double look. You know, when you don't realize what you saw and you look back? <clears throat> oh my God, did you see that? Second, it's the look of terror. <gasps> what was that? Third, it's the mocking look. You don't have to say anything. Just look and point and maybe even laugh outwardly. <laughs> and fourth, it's the pity look. This is by far the worst because you might not use words to inflict emotional pain, but the tip of the head and facial expression are enough.
If you have a disability, you might not be strong enough to withstand your everyday routine in the beginning, but in time, you would manage to control your feelings. You grow stronger, prouder of being capable for fitting into this world, of being an integral part of it, of being loved, of overcoming societal prejudice and rising above it. It is very challenging to put oneself in the position of another. It's understandable that one might not grasp the emotional turmoil that can be caused to someone if they are the victim of verbal abuse or gossiping. It is not, however, acceptable to avoid exercising your ability to empathize through the realization that the person you are targeting is a human being with feelings, just like you. I have learned through time to ignore and didn't feel empathy for those who criticize me purely for my appearance. It is, in my opinion, beneficial to have someone with a disability in your life. Your attitude towards life will be altered. You would be a more accepting, tolerant human being, and you would see that those who may target you are the ones in need of reconfiguration, especially in the area of the brain. Since they refuse to see the truth, that we are all different and unique in our own way, and that is a fact that we should cherish. At this point, I would like to mention that many individuals that have helped mankind succeed were considered normal. First, Stephen William Hawking is a British theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and author, and also my role model. Hawking was, is almost entirely paralyzed due to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, and communicates through a speech generated device. He has married twice and has three children. And second, Vincent William Magot was a Dutch post impressionist painter. After many years of painful anxiety and bout of mental illness, he died at the age 37. But through his illness, he discovered and uncovered for the world a whole new definition of painting. So, is there such a thing as an abnormality in human species? Let me tell you this. Nobody is normal. Everyone has unique characteristics that make them special. Traits that often may be not visible to the naked eye. Someone may be too tall or too short. Someone may be smart or unintelligent. And someone may be a little bit crazy. But that doesn't matter if one is comfortable within their own skin. Can you imagine if everyone was exactly the same? That would be very boring. In conclusion, it doesn't matter how we look on the outside, what psychological or physical issues we might be burned with, or what are the things of us? Because in the end, we all end up as fertilizer. In fact, it's our actions that define our lives and character, and those actions are the reason why we're to be remembered or forgotten. In Theodore Roosevelt's words, do what you can with what you have where you are. My expectation for my speech today, remember it. Remember my words, my voice, my beliefs. Think them over. Decide for yourselves. But remember one thing. You have the power to become the change you want to see in this world. Have belief in yourself and make the difference. Accept yourself and others the way they are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Our next finalist is from Moraitis, number 49, Mirto Vlazaki. Ladies and gentlemen, projecting the current demographic and socioeconomic trends, it is predicted that very soon more than 8 billion people will live on planet Earth forming one global community, trading in the same international markets, speaking multiple languages, and working for the same employers. Living in a vibrant, differentiated, and very complex communities, many, many things will indeed have to change. And one of them is the way that people organize themselves. In other words, the ideal political regime. The 19th and 20th centuries our past centuries actually gave a new sense 
to a philosophically conceived but a very, very limitedly applied up until then concept in political philosophy, the concept of democracy. What we saw was nationalistic revolutions all over Europe trying to transform democracy from a privilege to a right and later on to a prerequisite without which we, the citizens of the Western world, could not even imagine our life without. But ladies and gentlemen, this democracy became so idealized that it actually started forming part of our education, an education that is supposed to be ideologically free. Yet what it does is that it only promotes democratic ideals. Ladies and gentlemen, please take a step back and try to look at this situation with an open mind. This is a challenge indeed, after so many decades of a constant brainwash from a system that what tries to convince you of is that democracy is right. But please, is really democracy the regime that fits the society of century 21st, 22nd, 23rd, etc., etc.? Is really democracy in its actual sense a democracy that approaches the concept of representation in any way? And at the end of the day, is really democracy worth the struggles of being maintained? In her book, Not for Profit, Martha Nussbaum, the professor of law and ethics at the University of Chicago, advocates the necessity to safeguard this regime. How? By emphasizing humanities in the general core curriculum of Western universities. Therefore, the problem is there. The problem has been identified. Democracy is indeed at stake in a world teeming with indifference, in a world that lacks an internationally orientated curriculum. But ladies and gentlemen, let us have a look at the proposed resolution to extend education. How much? We live in a world where people pursue bachelors, 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 masters, PhDs, and yet they cannot find a job. We live in the era of educational inflation, as clearly termed after economic terminology, referring to a job market where too many skills, too many degrees, run after very low demanding jobs. This is what we leave. And yet, we still hear the paradox that what we need in our Western societies is actually more education, ladies and gentlemen. But this is not really what we need. With the current changes having already been paved, and in a world of a seven or eight million people, we have other priorities to cater for first. Our leaders, our international institutions, our charities should make sure that they now have the funds to educate at least six billion people, both now and in the future, on a long-term basis. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world where the United Nations have been recurrently setting goals and have failed to meet them, is the scenario any realistic? Do we as societies seem to care about how to make our world a more democratic place? Ladies and gentlemen, why is democracy so difficult? I have said in my speech one time that it needs just one condition on which to flourish. And what is this condition? It is an aware electorate. It is an electorate where the vast majority of people, the overwhelming majority, is able to cast an informed and conscious vote. But, although in words this might sound very easy, it is not. For three factors should run at the same time. Three factors that have never been cultivated at a worldwide level. One, interest. Two, education. And three, a global perspective. Even if I give our regime, and I want to give it the benefit of the doubt, education is not there, ladies and gentlemen. We live in a world that is growing unequally in terms of population. We live in a world where economically developed countries announce astounding birth rates. So this means that our world will continue to grow unequally in terms of education by proportion. Uneducated people will become more and more by percentage. But this is not the only problem. 
complexity of information, on the other hand, the antagonistic factor also continues to rise. Living in a globalized society, it means that we have to cope with more and more information. And as our educational system have, has provided us with this equipment, not us, Western people, people in general. Ladies and gentlemen, no, it hasn't. So, who is going to cover the costs? Who is going to actually pay for, so for our societies to become a democratic place overall? Currently, Nobody has. The answer is pending. And I suspect, as you, as the majority of you do, that the answer will also be pending in the future. So what does that mean? Does that really mean that we are justified as a society, as people of the world, to abandon democracy? No, because the problem, fortunately enough, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is not economic. We have the funds, but we distribute them unfairly. Because instead of trying to deepen and deepen education by providing primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and I don't know what other level of education to us, to the Western world, we can allocate these funds to countries that haven't even dreamed of access to basic education, ladies and gentlemen, countries where the majority of us do not know where they are found on the map. Countries such as Ethiopia, Lesotho, Eritrea, Mozambique, and so many other more countries that have never had those rights. This is the way that we, as a global society, as one, have the responsibility to act today. We have the responsibility to make our world a more democratic place, not our countries. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mirto. And now our last finalist is from Hayef, number 193, Alexandra Paivana. <laughs> I was a little girl, I had a collection of 22 Barbie dolls. I was so proud of it. I had given each doll a different name, and I would play with them, giving them each a perfect life. When I was younger, Barbie was starting to become more than just a blonde bombshell, the stereotypical image of a perfect woman at the time. She was now a doctor, a pilot, a vet, a nurturing mother, a loving wife, and a beautiful blonde bombshell at the same time. I dreamt that one day I could be all of these things, apart from the blonde hair, of course. That will never happen. That I would look at myself in the mirror and see a beautiful woman with my own business, a good wife, a loving mother, a perfect individual in every single way. As a young woman, I now look at myself in the mirror and see me, a far from perfect person. However, Western society forces me and all women to strive for that perfection on a personal, academic, and interpersonal level, making us concerned with our not ever being able to attain it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for a change. Although we women can do anything, we should not feel obliged to do everything, and to do everything perfectly. On a personal level, we women are haunted by perfection in terms of the ways that we view ourselves. Stereotypes enforced by society make us believe that a woman is not worth much unless, firstly, she fulfills the image of idealized beauty, regardless of her personality, behavior, and intelligence. This especially applies to young women in my age, where the image they have in school is extremely significant. We young women in this room have all been there. Everything is defined by how you look, regardless of whether you're smart or whether you've reached the finals in forensics four times. Studies have shown that at age 13, 53% of American girls are unsatisfied with their bodies. 
at 17, this number rises to 78%. These insecurities have symptoms that vary from blindly following the trend to anorexia. Outside the walls of school, though, as women grow older, expectations in terms of appearances change. Being skinny, although still very important, becomes secondary to looking younger, no wrinkles, and no gray hair. We think that the younger a woman looks, the skinnier she is, the more she looks like those Photoshop pictures of movie stars in the magazines, the more desirable she becomes in the view of society. And who doesn't desire to be desired, ladies and gentlemen? But this need to be wanted leads women to have a distorted image of their own individual beautiful selves. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that society doesn't value personality and intelligence in women at all, but these need to be accompanied by beauty, or more rather, the image of perfection. It's not good enough to just be beautiful, though. The contemporary woman has to be successful in the work world as well. She must be independent. She not cling on to men for financial support in her life, and thus, a successful career is essential. According to the most recent American freshman survey conducted by the University of California, the most frequently college majors selected by women are business or health-oriented studies, both generally leading to profitable careers. It's not as simple as it sounds, though, as sexism in the workplace does still exist. We think that women have achieved equality to men, while in reality, we live in a society where sexism takes a more silent and dangerous form. Women are juxtaposed against men, and therefore, equality is not achieved. A survey in 2006 showed that women above the age of 25 earned 78.7 cents for each dollar earned by men. And in addition to that, four in 10 businesses worldwide have no women in senior management. To succeed in her career, this new woman must often work harder to achieve the same status as a man, if that is even possible, and is pressured by perfection in this aspect of her world as well. Coming home from work late in the evening, the contemporary married woman finds a house that is a mess and the kids running around asking for her love and attention. Society expects the modern woman to maintain her role as a dedicated housewife, which she exclusively had before the female emancipation, and to perfect this role as well. Although women have succeeded in attaining various significant roles in society, the average number of hours that they spend on the house has remained the same. This applies to all working women who have decided to have a family as well as succeed in their career. Ladies and gentlemen, for years and years, feminists have requested independence, equality, the right to lead their own lives the way they want to. But instead of independence, what does the average working woman get? An exhausting schedule in which not only is she forced to perform successfully at work, but she also has to go home to a family that she needs to take care of. And on top of all that, she has to look beautiful 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Instead of independence, the average woman finds herself trapped in the image of perfection. Society expects the modern woman to be more than just a person. In fact, she's expected to be more than a Barbie, with all the accessories. Women feel like they have to strive for perfection, which they cannot attain, making them unhappy. Women should be granted the right to choose what they want to do and how they want to do it, without being pressured or criticized by society. It should be my choice whether I want to spend my whole life trying to look like a Barbie doll, or being the perfect career woman, or devoting myself to my family, or whether I want to do all three. Many women may choose to eliminate one of the three, because the pressure to be perfect in everything in life, from appearance to career to family, is just too much to handle. Not doing it all is not equivalent to being a failure, as society seems to make us women believe. I don't play with Barbie dolls anymore. And now, 
I know that if Barbie were a real woman, she would fall flat on her face, as her tiny little waist would not be able to support the rest of her body. She's not perfect. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. But you know what? That is okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And now we have eight honorable mentions. First one is from Pierce Sterios Dinopoulos, 122. From Anatolia Theodor Papazakariou, 238. From Anatolia Martha Kapazoglu, participant 226. From Hayef. Alex Afanasopoulos, 173. From Haev uh, Konstantinos Samaras, 202. From Anatolia Maria Agni Laliotti, 233. Mandulizis, Sean Zafiriazis, 111. And from Hayef Anastasia Repuliu 201. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the three judges Lee Anderson from ACS, Mirka Karayani from Costas Gitanas, and Peggy Liado from St. Lawrence. Please, I would like to ask you to keep to stay in your seats and not to get up. We're not going to have a break. We're just going to continue for the sake of time, okay? As I said, if you need to use the restrooms, under the bleachers behind. Group discussion in just a minute. For group discussion, I would like to invite Mr. Ian Harrington from Pinewood American International School to present the finalists. Good morning. I'm here this morning to present the finalists uh, who will be participating in this year's group discussion. As I call your name, please come to the front. You'll take your chair starting on my left, stage right, down to the stage left, please. First, from Pinewood, number 324, Savas Svairoblos. Number two, um, from St. Lawrence, Joshua Marks, 372. From Anatolia, Natalia Kansi, 214. Third, from Haif, Maria Alexia Platia. From Anatolia, Andreas Karagunis, 228. From St. Lawrence, Unhai Kim, number 369.
Mm -hmm. And finally, from Pinewood, Vespina Leolio, 315. So, for the judges' sake, uh, the numbers, starting from the last call, at the, starting from here? Okay, starting from here. Uh, number 324. Number seven, 372. Number 214. 200. 228. 369. And finally, 315. Good luck to all our contestants. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's group. Uh, I propose that we start uh, with our names so that the judges can follow better the um, our discussion. Would you like to start? Thank you very much. I'm Savas Peropoulos. I'm Josh Schmelt. I'm Natalia Sanzi. I'm Mary Alexia Platia. I'm Andreas Karagounis. I'm Annie. Okay, and now that we are done with the names, I propose that we read out loud the topic so that the, the, audi the audience know what, for, uh, what we're talking about. Andreas, would you like to read out loud the topic? Uh, okay. Uh, your group's task is to discuss the top five regulation controls that are necessary to ensure people's safety and privacy talking into consideration the and the expected rapid increase in the use of social media. I think we should start by defining what we mean by social media. Perhaps maybe we issues. should start by uh, defining a structure as to how this conversation... This um, I propose that we start with definitions so I that agree. we're talking... Uh, we know that we're talking about... By social media, we mean means of interactions among people um, to create and exchange ideas and information among virtual communities. So um, it can, this can have negative and positive aspects. and. Um, I would like now to define uh, what regulation is. And regulation is principle of rule employed in controlling, directing, uh, or managing an activity, organization, or system. And I would also like to define privacy as the state of being free from institutions and disturbance in private life and affairs scheduled, um, scheduled form uh, the, um, the present view of others. May I suggest now that we move, we move on to analyzing and defining what the main problems are with the yes. rapid increase forming, of social media? Structure. Yes, as to articulate our ideas That's and get right. a consensus so on what the form would be. So we should go over the five main points we're going to discuss and then go into each one in depth as we progress to the okay. discussion. Uh, before that, could we uh, just separate um, the regulations? I propose that we start with uh, the regulations provided from government and organizations and from companies and a school and not governmental organizations. Do you agree with the structure? Yeah. Yes, and I should think we, we should focus begin. on who is uh, making the regulations, who is enforcing them, yeah. or on their field of uh, where, where will they focus, who they who, will who apply. Who, who is uh, applying them? I think we should first focus on like the type of regulations and then mm -hmm. on the body that would be enforcing them. Okay. I believe that it is, uh, I think it's more useful to actually focus on, the, on where the, the regulation is um, directed to, for example, the individual, yeah. businesses, government in general. So yeah. that's great. Having the, having the state and this is where we can clearly, no yeah, and in this way we, we can see the specific dangers of the social media in each area, in each specific and therefore find specific yeah. solutions. Yeah. Okay, okay, let's start like that. Uh, so, um, a first point I would like to make um, is that I propose that the government should make uh, laws um, for people to own a site. So this means that if you want to create a site, then you get to go like to um, the state and say, I want to create this site. So everybody knows who is this, the, own, the owner of the site. So if we have any problems con um, concerning the safety or the people uh, that go on the social media, we can control them and penalize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we can make it easier for people to report um, people who are violating the regulations. 
Yeah. Although a, a great advantage of uh, social media and generally the internet is it being anonymous, so I think this may have been this would be a disadvantage and would lose a lot of the uh, public Actually, using social media. This uh, what I said is um, it, it has nothing to do with anonymity because if you own um, a social media, doesn't mean that um, the, there are no profiles that are anonymous. So everybody can express his opinion through social media, but we will know the owner of, the, of social media. And of course, the owner has not, nothing to do uh, with the well, people that on are the point of anonymity, I think one of the ways of making it easier to report uh, violations mm -hmm. of, that people make is to make it anonymous so that people uh, can report without feeling like that they will have to pay. Yeah, the report is going to be uh, it's going to be anonymous. Uh, just the, so uh, what the site is going to be like. It's so what you're anonymous. suggesting is the host. Yeah. Be, oh, okay. Yeah, I think I think the main problem is that we need to have someone responsible when there is violation because yeah. with all these social media networks, we don't know who's responsible. Like if the business violates, is the business violating or is the employees violating a certain rule? We have to be very focused on who yeah. owns the social media. I think we need to make the distinction between larger sites and smaller sites. I could have a blog which ten people follow. I might not have the skills to be able to go somewhere and say, oh, I own this blog. I think we should make the distinction that. Once it gets big enough, once you have a certain amount of users or followers, mm -hmm. then you have to declare yourself. That's great. I agree with that. Although, as, as to strengthen your point, Josh, I'd like to add that maybe we should uh, urge the government to enforce online certificates of its site as to make it more, as to make it easier for the site, the users of the site to uh, go there and also keep anonymity. What Sava said is really important, and actually there is all uh, there is um, a certificate that has to do with European um, social media. This is named a National Academic Recognition Inform uh, Information Center, and actually we could say that every site has to have this certificate in order, like, to be on the on the web, exactly. so that we control everything. Uh, that's going on uh, on the internet, so we don't have violation of copyright, violation of human rights, but, and. Uh, but then now, who would regulate the websites do not, that do not have that certificate? Exactly. The question. internet is a very broad thing. It's, yes. impossible, it's impossible to have many, enough people to regulate everything that goes on the internet. We need to have some, maybe some centralized system, which you can, where you, people have to first maybe. Or commit. maybe within the programs that are formed, let's say when you're making your website initially, there has to be this certain certificate that has to be signed. Yeah. Otherwise, or, you cannot upload it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or some form of self-moderation, which the people who use the site self-moderate. I know, for example, on YouTube or Facebook, if something is very negative, people will self-moderate because they don't like it. Yeah. You can uh, enhance that. Not enhance. Um, support the people who do this and tell them. And this should actually be incorporated in the um, privacy settings of each site so that also the, us the users are informed of this regulation of this certificate. Uh -huh. so, that, um, so you mean that we should like create uh, promotion campaigns in order to inform people exactly, about this? Exactly, because people should be informed of this uh, be because they have to accept it before actually becoming, for example, Yeah, well I suggest that uh, since they always have to, these sites always have to put terms and conditions before people can access and log into these sites, I think we should make it, uh, make it easier for people to read them and make it compulsory for each individual to read them because usually people skip it and w without bothering How to How exactly read would they make it compulsory? Yes, because yes. it's a huge text. It's like pages and pages. Well, and maybe they won't let it uh, scroll down too quickly. There are so or many <laughs> no, the drawback with this is that there are so many legal issues uh, involved with uh, promoting a, a website or a social media, especially in big websites such as Facebook or something like that, that, it's, that it can be almost impossible for the website to um, to make the terms and regulations really condense for people to... Yeah, and this well, comes down to personal oh, sorry, uh, no, uh, responsibility because it is up to each person to read the conditions. If um, a site or a blog or anything choose, it has um, the terms and conditions, it means that it is um, right um, and it is... Well, it, it follows yeah. the instructions, so um, maybe it is up to the yeah. person to read the, right. the terms. So. Well, allow me to say that in Western civilizations, each site is provided a domain name and a location on a server from a certain provider, broader company. <laughs> so maybe we should um, uh, apply laws which will enfor uh, urge these companies to apply regulations on their own uh, servers. Yes, that's a very good point, Savas, because and if providers. we take it by the core, which is a big provider that, every, that most uh, 
a social media derived from, then that would be a more effective I, way of I regulation. I would like to go back to the terms of agreement. I think mm -hmm. uh, we could all agree that it's very hard to read through all this text. I think it is possible to make like some bullet points in the beginning, indicating like the key, yeah. uh, let's yes. say, weaknesses that the website might have and the dangers that um, for your privacy, for example. So maybe in the beginning, which for each term, uh, there should be like, it should have concise points and then it should go in depth because yes. we do want to know what we're agreeing to in any case. Yes, Andreas, but the thing is that who is going to say what is important and what is not? I mean, the company that creates the terms uh, may say, okay, this is important. And the most important thing, because it's not, it's against the company, uh, may not be in the bullet. I mean, this is a problem. Well, I don't see why it would be so difficult to make it more concise in terms of agreement and make it easier for people to read it. I don't think she means that the problem is that... I don't think she means that the problem is... Yeah, but um, I believe that the problem is that some companies or um, might choose yeah. not to mention um, some of the, the specific yeah. conditions um, in the bullet points if we choose for that. But that's up to the discretion of the person. There can be concise bullet points designed by the company at the top for the generally, and if the person is worried or, or anything, yeah. they can read the whole terms of service. It's up to them. But it just yeah. makes it easier for the average person to see the summary of what will be yeah. in this long page. Okay, paper. well, if, uh, people, if we can't get people to read these terms of agreements and they don't know about the violations, like they can cause, I think, we should somehow raise awareness in other means so that they know about these things. Yes. They don't, yeah. <coughs> of course, there have been many guides as to how to know what you're sharing on Facebook, how to know uh, what you're doing online, that people, uh, these uh, red flags, if you're all aware, there's a book I can't remember the name of, there's a book that uh, makes you aware of the things you should know while joining a social media. So, so uh, guides I, like this and raising awareness could help uh, users uh, and not uh, be more aware about what they're doing. Exactly, and there are many campaigns, and actually the school plays a major role in this and could actually um, have campaigns to raise awareness regarding the safe use of social media, so that could be another point. But would you like us to wrap up with the, um, the, the part that, uh, the terms and conditions that we mentioned before moving on to another sure. regulation? We should move on yeah, to another point. point. So okay, uh, something else is that the government could provide free strong antivirus uh, programs to the citizens in order not to, uh, to have hacked this, uh, their uh, computers. And especially, uh, this is something very important for companies too, like banks, because they've got like, uh, client information that are very crucial. So I think that uh, governments should do something with antivirus programs. Yes, but the problem with antivirus programs is it, it, well, they work like antibiotics. The stronger you make it, the stronger the viruses will be developed constantly. And yeah, also, so maybe that wouldn't mm -hmm. be an effective measure. And also allow me to say that modern hacking taking place in this virtual environment of social media is not only focused on, is not only limited uh, on viruses, but also we have malware, we have spyware, we have uh, phishing and packing. Mm -hmm. And we uh, also have bots, so we need an all-in-one program, program for oh, internet security. What you say, yeah, it's, it's really good. I mean, uh, we can like combine all this uh, stuff in one program and then uh, upload to the internet so everybody can uh, There are many such that. programs on the internet. Mm -hmm. For example, some examples uh, are, for example, AVG, Internet mm -hmm. Security, or Kaspersky, and many other companies offer such, uh, although they are very expensive. So should, do you believe that we should focus on the price rather? So yes, that would be more universal. Yeah. Like the government security. could possibly, let's say, subsidize it, like, since yeah. it's such subsidize an important. It. But we can't expect from, like, private companies to be paying, like, for free. And I think we need to split. For free. I think we need to split what companies will use and what your average home computer user will use. Because, in general, a hacker won't go into someone's personal computer when I'm on the internet. But, so we need to make maybe some sort of free or subsidized antivirus, which stops the viruses that just flood around the internet. But the more powerful ones, they need more Private, like private companies for the banks and other businesses, which have really important information. That's a great get. point. Oh, yes. I would okay. like to point out that uh, companies actually don't exactly use viruses. They use these cookies that um, track your uh, that uh, are files that uh, are in your computer, and mm -hmm. they, they track your trends. And the, with data mining technologies, they track your your. Um, what you yeah, Exactly, yeah. and then they use targeted advertising. Um, so therefore, um, there is no privacy. Uh, with um, oh, how you're acting and what you're doing. So therefore, I believe that what is important is not exactly an antivirus, but to find a way for, um, for this um, 
for this tracking and this data mining to stop because it is violating the privacy of the users. That is yeah. a very good point, actually, um, and uh, it's important to note that uh, this doesn't even that doesn't happen only in uh, scam websites and websites that have a specific aim of deceiving you into doing something, buying something, or providing something, but also in bigger companies. Uh, once again, I'm bringing up Facebook. I'm beginning to repeat myself, but that can by agreeing to its terms and conditions, you give them the right to uh, to download a full copy of your conversations with anyone, download your pictures, have uh, basically own all the information and be able to sell that you provide. I agree with that, uh, and I'd, I'd like to add, uh, oh, no, sorry, for thank you. And I'd like to add, uh, of course, that sharing data is completely on the <laughs> individual's hands. I mean, if you don't read the regulations, then it is uh, your problem what's going on afterwards. However, but ha however sure. we could also uh, d enforce what you said, that we should uh, let the people be aware of the dangers and what is really happening with private companies. Well, not only private companies, with many companies that they sell your information. Uh, for example, Google is selling information to other uh, to advertising companies, although that is controllable. That is the individuals, uh, falls in the individuals' realm of uh, Management. I think, oh, I think uh, we should wrap up on the... the oh, just yeah. one point uh, regarding yeah. okay. what we mentioned, that um, um, Facebook may actually, when you, um, ha by having a Facebook account, you might agree to this, but there are other companies like Twitter who has admitted to, um, to have access to the, um, the, the phone contacts of uh, its users in order to um, have to take more information about the users, and then it sells it to advertising companies in order for them to uh, actually um, have information about users and then do the, um, have our targeted advertising. So mm -hmm. it is more than just the, um, the terms and regulations, it is about the company. So I think that the regulation should be more about uh, the targeted to the companies and not yeah. to the awareness of the, the users and the Actually, terms and conditions. What Maria said is right, but I think that what Sava said like uh, can deal with the problem of cookies because if we have like an antivirus program that has everything, anti spy and everything, and we can deal with cookies. Of so course, we can yeah. disable the cookies. Yeah, in my definitely. computer, for example, I already have done so. So it's not impossible. It's not yeah. something impossible. Although to that's do. a very very good point. Uh, <laughs> What I wanted to point out, what, what all of this is linked to, is that um, I'm sure that if you ask someone uh, that hasn't had much experience with computers, but they're, they're not, it's not a small group, they won't know what cookies are, and therefore they won't know how to protect so themselves. So that ties with the social. awareness that we yes, yes but not yeah. only awareness, but also, but also education about uh, uh, on yeah, technology campaign. and yes, programming exactly. and all that kind of stuff. I feel like it's been very um, yeah. undermined that uh, something so important and so present in everyone's lives has not had a formal education. So yeah, I think apart from antivirus programs that you said some people can't uh, have access to because of the cost or it's difficult to use, I think uh, another organization that can have a great impact on uh, regulations is the police force that we have in local communities. Mm -hmm. uh, to use FBI as a role model, like they have cyber squads uh, with analysts and um, professionals who examine digital evidence of hackers or... Um, so but we first need to like, educate these policemen. Like, I believe personally that most of them won't know exactly all these sort of problems with uh, hacking, spyware. I think we have to first form some sort of organization, uh, sort of not organization, education committee to educate the policemen first, and then yes, they could be a very effective body. Actually, yes. oh, no, no. Um, uh, actually, what Andreas uh, says is right, and I think that we should enforce cyber crime, uh, not only with education, but with money too, so that we uh, establish a strong enough uh, police department for cyber crime. Mm -hmm. So we need to encourage both in all institutions, like such as the police force or schools, to educate all the people who will be involved. Yeah. Um, how they can regulate and how they can stop these things. I believe that also not only um, students or uh, the people who are using the social media but, uh, and um, the policemen, for example, that will deal with the cyber crimes, but also employers and employees are greatly affected by social media. So training should be and awareness, uh, raising awareness should be targeted to all those groups yes. who yes. use social media. That is, social media. Yeah. Go ahead. Go uh, that is an excellent point. And also, I think what makes people um, uh, 
commit more crimes, if you, if you call it that, online and on social media rather than in real life, is that uh, both real life and online life are both two separate communities. However, we have a stronger sense of community right now in real life with human interaction than we do online, although it's not really so. You can do so many things online and on social media that you can't do here, and it's equally as yeah. illegal. So we can inform so. the people, both students and employers, about the benefits that uh, but, yeah, but benefits that then shouldn't we, the, main, the main issue with that is that we have sort of sometimes on the internet like a hidden identity. Should we make a policy so that we could have like our identity clear on the internet? Like for example, like no fake profiles should be like prohibited yeah. with on the internet, even if you're, especially when it's a fake profile of someone else, like you're copying someone else's information and presenting as your own. I agree because identity theft is a great issue. However, how is this going to be enforced? Because it is, in theory, it is great, but Practically, how could this? Actually, Maria, I think that Andreas is saying that we should report such fake yes. profiles. Maybe so, that. if we re uh, keep reporting, then um, the how are they going to be tracked, though? Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Since uh, you report uh, a fake profile, then the company, uh, for example, Facebook or another social media, get informed and track this person to see. Uh, if, uh, really yeah, I think yeah. this is the case where I think cyber squads can be really helpful. Yeah. 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 I think we need to increase, yeah. using the cyber squads, Andy said before, penalties and laws that strictly target yeah. these people and ways to punish them to discourage people from doing it in the and first place. As mentioned before, uh, I think as Josh mentioned, about we could use self-regulation here and really promote self-regulation because that would be very effective as all these social media sites are really huge. Self-regulation, I personally, is most effective as, uh, as you mentioned in YouTube previously, as uh, these people can instantly see uh, what the problem is and report it. And also, let's not forget that we have state-of-the-art technology that could be uh, built in into the huge systems of these modern colossal companies. For example, we have artificial intelligence programs which can analyze the patterns behind the profiles of each user and see their validity uh, or not. Because I have met many users who are using fake email addresses. And that has caused a huge problem because afterwards, after they violate the rule, for example, they are not easy to track. <coughs> so I believe that not only should we allow, should we uh, enforce the use of modern uh, AI systems, but also the use, the application, and the uh, the application of modern firewalls on uh, on uh, huge companies such as. Facebook or Google. Not that they are, their firewalls are not is insufficient, although a more uh, and a strengthened one would help against uh, hacking and phishing, which are the main problems in social media today. At this point, I believe I think we should move on a bit, like to problems that occur within the school, mm -hmm. like maybe with cyberbullying. Cyber bullying. Yeah. As w it was a great disadvantage that we discussed like yesterday. So, would anyone want to propose some sort of solution? Well, I think cyberbullying is big problem because it can also lead to in-person bullying within the school mm -hmm. and I think um, we can't really completely prevent this but we can reduce the extreme cases that occur often. Um, would anyone like to give examples? Of Actually I agree with Andreas uh, and his point is really important because 58% of kids have been bullied through social media and actually what we could do is that we could create like boxes at schools where uh, anybody could, could put like a note inside um, uh, anon anonymously uh, so that uh, they talk, they um, report um, cases where they ha have been bullied from a classmate or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, in my opinion though, I believe, uh, sorry, no, you're, yeah, I spoke uh, in my opinion, uh, I believe that we should use something more drastic, something mm -hmm. which will I provide agree. results as soon as possible due to the fact that cyberbullying is a major disadvantage of uh, social media and it's caused by people. We don't want something that jeopardizes someone else's yeah. uh, health, not only f physically, which is uh, in the real world, but virtually in the world of social media. We don't want something that jeopardizes someone's psychological health. And uh, la only last year, 1,300 suicidal attempts yeah. were prevented by organizations. I think the most effective way, in my opinion, um, to prevent, to reduce uh, cyber bullying is to inform the parents. 
So we can also educate yeah. the parents because they have a control over their students. Exactly. Their I children. agree because, like, uh, for example, only one in six parents in the U.S. are, are aware that their their children are being mm -hmm. bullied, cyber bullied, actually, and 74 percent don't even think that cyberbullying is an issue in general, so yeah. raising awareness not only to uh, students and educators, but also towards parents is yeah. a, is, um, that is a very a good point, but keep in mind that many uh, cyberbullying victims are ashamed of their condition and of what's happening to them. There is more shame about being cyberbullied than there is about being physically bullied in an actual setting. So that may prevent many um, cyberbullying victims to come out to parents, friends, or teachers. Yeah, that's why I think oops. that. Well, I think in, by informing them, we can make it easier for them to come out and tell their parents, tell their uh, counselors, teachers. Well, so uh, I, I, I say. But we, also with like cyberbullying, there's something that we haven't mentioned. It's on the it's on the internet, so we can clearly, like for example, just close the account or block the bully. We have this option completely and to avoid the bully 100%. Yeah, like oh, in no. real bullying, sometimes like in real life. There, you don't have this option mm -hmm. of avoiding the bully. Like, he might corner you out of school, but at your home, on your computer, you have that option. So I think we should really advocate this. However, um, as technologies evolve, it is very hard, and bullies find new ways to harass yeah. their victims. Therefore, um, I don't think that the government, for example, could find a way to enforce something like this, because that would definitely violate the privacy yeah. of the users. Yeah, as a concerned the students, uh, we can't use too drastic ways to uh, prevent cyberbullying. I think as someone said before, raise awareness, and I think that would be most effective. I way. think as someone said before, it's important that we raise awareness and t uh, t teach teachers and parents the signs to look for. So yeah. maybe if the student is embarrassed, because as someone said before, they don't want to say, oh, I've been bullied on the internet, but people can go to them, and it feels like someone is really trying to help them if someone comes to you and says, I've realized that you have a problem, I'm here to help and I, you that. And I think it's really important, like, uh, as you mentioned, with the parents especially, like, parents should really be encouraged to, like, just sit down and talk with uh, their kids. That, mm -hmm. I think that's, like, the most effective measure, measure, like, ask them how their day was and be very specific and do not consider, like, bullying something that just should, for example, oh, just ignore it. It's something more than that. Although, let's not forget that, as Alexis said previously, that, like, 84% of uh, American parents no, uh, believe that the advantages of the of social media outweigh the disadvantages. So what I believe we should do is enforce an educational program, maybe during mm -hmm. the IT and ICT lessons, uh, which would educate the students and parents, of course. We, ha we could have parent I meetings think, and yeah. student and meetings. Teachers, I think for parents and teachers, that yeah. can hold, uh, schools can hold conferences and exactly. weekend meetings. Although those are very good points, I have another suggestion to make. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, uh, since there are many um, consequences and uh, uh, for actual bullying in schools or in any environment. And, but if someone is cyber bullied, there's no real consequence uh, for the bully. Like, if, if someone is bullying you online and you just choose to avoid them, they still have bullied you, but there are no consequences for them. Where in the school setting, if a teacher sees that you're bullied, physically bullied, there will be some consequences for the bully. So I think there, it, it, well, the school setting should take cyberbullying more seriously because we don't really take it seriously. Yeah, so they nice. think it's something really mild that you can just close off that tab and yeah. ignore the bully forever. But it's not really so. So the school setting, any setting really, should take cyberbullying more seriously as an actual issue and also um, enforce the same consequences as it would have been, uh, as uh, there would have been in real life bullying. I think we should go back to the point we raised before, where some centralized body and the regulations, where if this cyberbullying does occur, they can report it to this institution, yeah. who have maybe a cyber unit or something but similar, like, to find and punish these people. Actually, what you said uh, is right, and we could like supplement uh, this measure by making supporting uh, supportive lines. Uh, where uh, you can report that you've been bullied and there are like help of specialists and psychologists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that you feel I, better. I agree with another way, but I believe like this Thanks. sort of body should be like formed with the students because the problem is it occurs like within the students. So I think students be included within this organization because like mm -hmm. students themselves could promote among friends and really stop the problem of bullying. Yeah. Like if you have specialists, it's not always mean that they're going to be able to stop it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, there are some many organizations such as GASP that inform uh, students about the consequences of cyberbullying and other um, problems such as, um, the, for example, the choking game, which is promoted through yeah, social yeah. media. Mm -hmm. So, but I believe I agree that with Andreas that we should have students involved in the in these organizations so that it is easier 
to be promoted throughout the yeah, season. Yeah, I think what it comes down to is um, to their, I think there are two separate uh, methods. I think one is what other external organizations can do to uh, help prevent these things. And the other thing is how they, people themselves can help themselves. Nevertheless, I believe that due to time constraints, we have only t uh, 30 minutes left. So yeah. we should start formulating our ideas. Uh, does but anyone want to sum up? Okay, yeah. Yes. First of all, uh, we've got uh, what um, Hacking, Saba basically. said about uh, certificates and NARIC certificate. Then we have the law uh, that has to do um, with permissions. If you want to make a site, you've got to take a permission for government. Then we've got the free antivirus pro uh, programs mm -hmm. that are a package the only of one applications. Yeah, and on that point, we mentioned the police force and how they can help uh, yeah. with the yeah. Okay. And then we have um, an informational campaign and supportive lines that are going to um, inform both uh, parents uh, and uh, students. And on that point also we have said mm -hmm. uh, to educate uh, everyone to about educate. how they can yeah. use it. And and actually parents for students. Right. And incorporate this in the educational system mm -hmm. so that it is mandatory. Yes, in, yeah. the con in the context of the IT lesson for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. we could and uh, well. we talked about terms uh, and, of conditions. and conditions yeah. of uh, social networks. Mm -hmm. that, that there needs to be bullet points in the beginning. I think also we talked about uh, identity theft. Yeah. And how we need regulation of that, and that uh, we also talked about mm -hmm. most effective ways with both, um, uh, yeah, with the most effective ways with this identity theft was that like self regulation could be enforced, and also with other problems too, self regulation was very okay. effective. Yeah. So let's start prioritizing yeah. our ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most important one of all the, not the most important one, but the one that would, um, uh, that would be more drastic and more effective when placed in the social media setting. Would be um, uh, would be antiviruses uh, certificates getting permission for starting up something because uh, I think it's more important to prevent something than to solve it when the problem has already uh, right. developed. Exactly. So it's, it's I think permission to start up a site and antivirus are two separate points. Yes. Okay. I would agree. So, so all in one security programs basically. So, mm -hmm. so what okay, would security be programs. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree that antivirus, these antivirus programs should be first uh, in our priority because they affect also <coughs> all groups. It, they're not specifically like students. Where, um, for example, cyberbullying affects only students, whereas this is a, a more very global broad. and broader issue. Uh, something else uh, we forgot to say uh, on some map. Joss had said that uh, we could penalize uh, the hackers. Yes, so we sure. should yeah, take so once they're reported. To, yeah. We can so, but the certificates, okay. I got a bit confused. Yeah. Where do we place those? Now, first seconds? one is security prob pro problem, sorry. And the second one is certificate, right? Certificate. Online certificates. Online certificates. Of, uh, so that we know the sites are legal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, exactly. Well, just where it's not really legal, but safe. safe. I'd like to suggest the third point would be cyberbullying, as it's very important to protect the youth and increase awareness, as we said before, to parents and teachers and yeah. to prevent the problem. As problems occur from cyberbullying in the future, and it's as I think it was you who said, if you prevent the problem now, it doesn't become a bigger problem later. later. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. just uh, what you're saying is to make a campaign to inform uh, students okay. mm -hmm. and teachers? Cyberbullying okay. campaigns in the context what, of the educational system. What about the box that, that Leah mentioned uh, that you could place anonymous complaints? Would we agree on that? I, I think that goes to a form of reporting and how we can... It would be included in the overall okay. campaign yeah, to stop like cyberbullying. However, I don't believe that we can actually enforce something like that to exactly. a school. Because it is just a way it. of... It, it could be like a proposal. A promotion. I think uh, we can encourage schools yeah. to we do could that. Have, yes. Yes. Actually, <laughs> uh, along with a cyberbullying, we could... Uh, a cyberbullying campaign, we could... Uh, uh, put uh, supportive lines with specialists and psychologists, and as Dora said, uh, students can be involved in this procedure. Yeah. Although I believe that, it's not that I agree mm -hmm. with your idea, it's very nice, in fact. Uh, although I believe that there are already enough uh, support lines, and the problem is that uh, students feel uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable expressing their own feelings to other people, they're not that open. So uh, yeah, but maybe, maybe we like could educate them. Counselors and teachers, yeah. if they can be more encouraging. Exactly. Yeah, perhaps we could make it more of the norm than it is. But we like can make it more accepting. I think that goes part of educating teachers when we hold conferences and send out pamphlets. But, yes, with, this, but with this body, for example, that, uh, that we've mentioned, they could evaluate these complaints within like this 
box, for example, like who would evaluate these? We have to have someone that would evaluate. And it wouldn't okay. be something big. It would just be like four or five students with like two teachers and a parent. It would be a small little committee, I would say, within the school, not something that would be extra that we have to pay. It would be someone that would be of encouraged course. within the school. Try yeah, to make a more localized system to deal with it so students don't feel pressured that they're going to a big like government yeah. body, someone yeah, local, yes. so they feel they can talk to them. On a more it's it's a close environment, so if it's, com it's, if it's composed by a parent, a teacher, and a few students, they feel like they're covered from our areas, from the parental area, the educational area, and from their social circles. Okay. I agree. However, um, cyberbullying can take very extreme forms, and it can lead to um, extreme consequences to the health of the students, both mental disorders, yeah. and even we've seen yeah. cases of suicide. So I don't believe that students and teachers have the, the not the power, but the knowledge to deal with the, these issues. Well, Perhaps exactly. if we had a campaign of informing yeah. parents and yes. teachers, that so, would be so achieved. education yeah. is the key. So and I don't think it's mainly more. like, I don't think, at least for pre in present day, it's mainly an issue of the parents and teachers not being able to confront it, but rather for it not, it not being able to detect it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. So campaigns and like education, where we put that, would we put that number four above cyberbullying? Shouldn't that be uh, a part of cyberbullying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it would be together? Cyberbullying campaign but then, in order to but combat. Then there's all the campaigns and well, so we don't, education. Well, uh, so we don't come up to too much disagreements. I say uh, we don't prioritize the five top that we've mentioned, but just mention the top five out of all that we've discussed. Okay, okay, but do you believe that we should have two different, um, for example, campaigns regarding cyberbullying and different campaigns regarding um, um, social media and the I safe use of the I think we should put that in one topic for education and raising awareness. Yes, but, I, uh, yeah. I yeah. yeah, okay, that's right. But we have but, five minutes But education left. of the police force, for example, that has to be separate. It can't yes, be. But yeah, that is a different, yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. So, okay. so yeah. let's see what we have so far. First of all, we have all-in-one security program. Secondly, we have educating uh, no, campaign. Certificate. Certificate. Online, certificate. online certificates. Yes. yes. And uh, thirdly, as we just said, we have educational campaigns against cyberbullying. Cyber uh, actually, could I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Perhaps yes. we could combine certificates with penalties and law, since se course. if, uh, if um, social media basically. is not under, it does not own a certificate, is not yeah. permitted to be online, online then they should be penalized. And sanctions, yes. maybe. Yes, so maybe. perhaps we could combine these two into one. Okay. okay. But still, we sort of, I feel that we left out sort of the education. No, I think we've mentioned Awareness. But like it was towards cyberbullying more like point three. I think yeah. we should clarify more that education should be perhaps education yeah. on programming and the computers. Like, and I personally think it should be a point on its own. I'm not sure if you agree, but I think it's like very important. Yeah, we could have education of um, students and teachers and parents regarding cyberbullying, and then a different point regar um, regarding that, that is um, targeted to the general public. Okay, okay. The public, but also more other disadvantage, more problems other than cyberbullying that social media can cause. Yes, but that I feel that this. Or, uh, to, to, solve, to solve the solution, we could just say that like uh, there should be like education or campaigns, but it should also include cyberbullying. Yeah, so it would be very okay. general. And then in point so three, we would just say people. as a subtitle, would definitely have cyberbullying. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah. now let's move on to the fourth point. Okay. Yeah, so we, um, so we, um, we talked about campaigns regarding the safe use of social media in general, and cyberbullying will definitely be a part of that. Yeah. 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 And then another. Uh, uh, regulation or control that are necessary that we mentioned is uh, like external organizations such as police force who can, uh, with their experts, they can uh, examine digital evidence to find hackers, etc. And uh, government. So, so cyber okay. uh, cyber crime uh, department in yeah. police. Okay. Uh, something else is that uh, we should know the owner of a social media, and everybody that wants to create a social media should. Um, uh, report that to the state. That falls inside yes. the realm of online certificates. Okay, so okay. Yeah. should we move on to the last one? Oh, however, yes. uh, going back to what Andreas said, I believe that the training of the, um, um, the police forces so, yeah. and also uh, employers and police in general should be yeah. either another point or mm -hmm. should be under the, the category of education and general yeah. raising I awareness. Think so. the police force and education are a bit different. Yes. So we could say that education, the point three that we mentioned with education and campaigning, this could be gener like targeted at the general public and would include cyberbullying, but point four could be education campaigning, but also include at the police force and the government officials, uh, general, the governmental. Okay. governmental. Okay. So, we're, so we're taking point four as the more law enforcement service, yes. not the yes, laws exactly. themselves, the way of regulating the rules. Okay. Okay. So now, due to time constraints, for the last one, I believe it should be strengthening uh, firewalls on uh, of. Uh, computer systems of 
Uh, about the private no, security don't. program. Yes, exactly. yes. Yes. No, although that focuses on the individual, but not rather the business that is providing. Oh, so uh, you mean uh, uh, the yeah. uh, let people have access to it? Yes, so basically okay. we should enforce and strengthen. Uh, so stronger security walls. systems uh, when it comes to bigger, uh, to a bigger scale, exactly. like businesses exactly. and big social media. Which provide the social media to the people. Okay, okay. okay great. Yeah, that so better a storage of data. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, a big, big storage of the yeah. better, better. better. Okay. So we enforce them uh, through uh, sub subsidizing mainly. Mm -hmm. okay. So encouraging companies to make their product more accessible to the average person, and encourage the government themselves to possibly make a free service, which everyone can easily get their hands on okay. to protect themselves. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Would someone like to number down the? Yeah, we have uh, one minute left. So I think well, yeah. Okay. There things we oh. said: raising awareness through education, uh, parents and employers. Uh, would, would okay, so point. let's not rush. We have, uh, first of all, the all-in-one security program. Secondly, would anyone like to mention the second uh, one? Sure. Secondly, we've got the online, online certificates and penalties. Third, and sanctions, yeah. yeah. Third, we have uh, education campaigning to the general public and to schools, but specifically targeted uh, point that we targeted at cyberbullying, which is very important. Uh, so fourth four point. Fourthly, we have external organizations uh, involved, such as uh, police, force. police force, and, and uh, to in order to confront, to confront cyber crime. Mm -hmm. And the and last one. Fifth. And finally, we have the free antivirus and increasing the mm -hmm. people's access to these type of mm -hmm. programs that help. By encouraging the businesses. To okay. So thank you all very much. Thank you all here. Thank you, John. and hopefully some effective outcomes. I'd also like to mention some honorable mentions that uh, uh, need to be noted. Um, St. Catharines, Alberto uh, Polimeni, number 68. Yitonas, um, uh, Panos Georgopoulos, uh, number 151. Uh, Anatolia, Yihao Kwang, uh, 224. Fra again from Yitonas, uh, Eliana Skulariki, 164. Uh, from Pinewood, Argirios Dumas, 312. And finally from St. Lawrence, Teodora Terni, uh, number 387. Thank you for a wonderful group discussion period this forensics. Congratulations. I would like to thank the judges, Vespina Sarandidu from Mandulidis, Emma Dodd Simboras from Expedactiana Yenisi and Georgia Marquetos from Piers. For impromptu speaking, we'd like to begin, please, if you could take your seats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please take your seats. For impromptu speaking, I would like to invite Ms. Ann Peters from St. Catherine's British School to present the finalists. Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you to the final of uh, Impromptu Speaking and I'd like to call upon our first finalist from Pierce, Komlinos John Plows. There I was, two years ago, taking an exam in New Greek and writing an essay on the European Union. And I believed that I had written the best essay of my life. But when I got it back, I received a 15 out of 20. Needless to say, I was outraged. And I asked my teacher, why? And he told me, very simply, you didn't support your views. But I said, look, look at my arguments. What are you saying? Do you know what you are saying, he asked me? I couldn't answer that. Well, one of the most cliched quotes of our time is, dip your tongue in your brain 
before you dip it in the outside. Think before you speak. But I wish to have meant that quote. Think before you speak and read before you think. Because people are not informed today. That's the problem. And especially when you're doing debate or when you are called upon to express your views on a subject that is being discussed in the wider society, you need to know what you're saying. So, what do you need to read, first of all? Well, my answer would be anything relevant to the topic you are about to discuss. If you are about to discuss politics, you must have read newspaper articles in order to know what is going on in the world. If you are going to discuss science, you might as well have read a science book to get the basics in your head before you actually move on to comment them. As for when do I need to read? I mean, how do I know that I must read? Well, <laughs> do I really need an answer to that? When you read, you read. You can read any time, at any place, because you must always read in order to keep yourself up with the pace of the things that happen around you in any sector. And lastly, and the most important thing I wish to convey to you, why do you need to read? I mean, okay, I can think. I've got critical thinking, right? Yeah, right. I never said you didn't. But no matter how good an argument may be, you must always be able to support it with hard facts. If you don't have hard facts, then you might as well throw your argument into the bin because if someone who is better informed than you comes up and says, what about this example where your argument doesn't apply, sir? And you can't respond, then obviously something is not going right. You must read because you must know how to base your argument, first of all, and if you have your argument, where to base it. You must have the facts and you must have the reasoning behind the facts and this can only be obtained through reading. It is no mere coincidence that the more you read, the better you can express yourself. The next time I wrote an essay, I had read a few articles on the European Union. I got a second chance for my teacher. And that next essay got a 19 out of 20. Because I, explained, I included a couple of examples that were on the spot. For example, the Treaty of Lisbon. I had included examples, and I knew what was going on. My teacher was much more pleased. And that is my point. Read before you think, and think before you speak. Thank you. <laughs> Commonly not this topic was think before you speak, read before you think. And I'd like to call upon our second impromptu finalist from St. Lawrence College, Dennis Stefan. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, they say every day you learn something new. And today I learned a couple of new things about Anatolia. We had this brilliant slide presentation which kept going on and on and on. And I found out some interesting facts. For example, in 1914, when the Turkish invaded Greece during World War I, this school had to close for three years. But then it reopened. And in 1940, during the Nazi invasion of Germany, this school was occupied and actually used by the Germans as a headquarters for the Balkan Wars. But then the school reopened. And so this school survived many hardships. But one thing which wasn't mentioned in the slide, which this school survived, and which we all survived, a hardship we sure overcame, was 21st of December 2012. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we all remember the movies that we had, 2012, how we brought up this whole, um, this whole uh, noise about the mind predictions that we, the world is going to end in 2012. And if I could travel back in time, I'd travel back to the Maya times and slap them. <laughs> because all this turmoil that we had, all, these, all this money pumped into movies to um, try and scare people that the world is going to end in 2012, this is just ridiculous. But you see, the point is, it's actually our fault. I mean, we as a human society, we try and predict things. We have statistics. We, we really are bad at it. Well, first of all, we already showed that the minds are really bad at it, but we ourselves are really bad at predicting future things. So we start being cautious of the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's why we were scared of 2012. That's why we, we, we weren't sure. We were scared that perhaps the minds were right and the world is going to end. That is why this one American citizen built a whole fortress somewhere uh, in the middle of nowhere to protect himself from a possible zombie, a zombie apocalypse. And that is why all these resources were spent to uh, protect um, the world from a meteorite, for example. And all these movies based upon meteorites and global cataclysm hitting the United States of America. But you know what? A couple of months ago, a meteorite did fall in Russia. Well, that was a waste, wasn't it? It fell somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and all the preparations that we had, the infrastructures to prevent meteorites, the um, media presentation to show the world that a, media, that a meteor will fall, we can prevent it, that was all pointless. And the reason is because we spend too much time thinking about the future. And if I was able to travel back in time, I'd tell those people, forget about the, all those issues, forget about the things which you can't predict and you think are going to happen in the future because you're scared. Think about the present. Think about now. We have many problems right now that we have to solve and face, whether it is economic crisis, whether it is substantial um, practical problems that we face today in society. Let's not think about the meteorite that will come again in 2025 and might pass by Earth or might not pass. Let's think about real problems, food shortages, economic crises, global warming that we have to prevent right now. And so if I were able to come back in time, travel back in time, I'd tell people not to fear the future. Thank you. Dennis's topic was, if I could travel back in time. Now I'd like to call upon our third finalist for impromptu speaking. It's from St. Catharines, Francesco Lavascio.
this is 10 seconds of silence for all, for all of you guys, really, for all of the victims of competitive education, of a system which pushes you beyond your limits, a system which pushes you to perform in ways that you are not built to perform. An intellectual student will want to develop their ideas, will want to bring intellect further, not push themselves to compete with, with their peers, to hide their work from their peers, to be able to get further than him. We want a world of intercommunication. We want education to extend towards the students, not to extend to work towards a competitive workplace. Now, all this situation of competitive education, etc., makes me think of a, of a very good friend of mine, of what was actually my last year's debate partner, Mr. Sarandaris. He, he was coming here last year, and uh, he wanted to come here this year as well. He said, hey, we're going to come together and we're going to win Panhellenic's debate competition. But what happened was that he got an offer from the very competitive University of Cambridge. And what I think is that Girton College stole his soul. He didn't have a chance to come here and have fun and press emotion and have a laugh with his friends at the party last night. He had to stay home and study because they want you to perform better than everybody else. They want you to be above everybody else that's applying because otherwise their name is going to get damaged. I'm not, I'm not criticizing these institutions. I'm not criticizing the good education that is being offered by these institutions. What I'm criticizing is the mentality behind these institutions. That education is about excelling above someone else, about scoring higher than what you can possibly score. Because what I believe is that humanity progresses by interaction and not by individual closed-in studying. I believe that in this age of the internet and of intercommunication, what education should be moving towards, edu what education should be having an extension towards is intercommunication and interlinkage and understanding. Because what moves society forward is people discussing is peer reviewing, is people arguing with each other like we're doing here today. And this is why education should meet these goals, should meet the goals which bring forward society and not goals which create competitive <coughs> students which cannot interact with their peers, which only want to excel above everybody else. And this is why I believe competitive education stole like he left Saradari's soul, like he's go it's going to steal all of our souls, probably. And this is why I believe the system has to change. Thank you. And Francesca's topic was extension. So now I'd like to call upon our fourth finalist from Moraiti Sano Sukaki.
Ladies and gentlemen, I came up here today and in 30 seconds, I had to choose between these three topics. Shame, if I could hear one sound and one sound only for the rest of my life, and your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. And to be honest, I just couldn't choose. I wish I could talk about sounds being ashamed in a limited time or something like that, but I just, I just can't make sense of it. I just couldn't choose. And I couldn't choose because I wasn't taught to choose. I was taught to want it all. And to be honest, I do want it all. And I do want to include all these three parts in my speech. Now, why is that? It's because society taught me to want it more. It's because I was raised in a world of pluralism, a world of greed, a world of want, and want, and want, and want, until your soul rots. So my point here is that nowadays we have become so greedy, so wanting, so demanding that we fail to see so many other things in life. As I said, I couldn't choose one of these three topics because I just wanted to combine them and make something impromptu-like out of them. And I couldn't. And that is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. Society nowadays is producing individuals who want it all. And I'm not just talking about wanting more shoes or wanting more friends. I'm talking about actually not being able to get satisfied. Just look at me. I'm wearing three, two belts, and I'm talking about three things at the same time. What I'm trying to say here is that this mentality is not leading us anywhere. We are filled in, with a world of individualistic citizens who miss out on so many other beauties of life. No, as it was stated in an oratory, we cannot be perfect and we cannot have it all. You cannot be a perfect husband, a perfect businessman, a perfect sportsman, a perfect, a perfect orator. You cannot be everything. And that is the beauty of human nature. What I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't go, go crazy about being perfect, not go crazy about having it all. We're missing out on such beautiful things. And I'm not saying that we're becoming evil people like the Kardashians or Justin Bieber. <laughs> I'm just saying that we are missing out on things like hanging out with your friends, wasting some time, not choosing something, and then wondering, what if I had chosen the other one? I'm talking about being human. We can have it all, and that's the beauty of it. Thank you. So Thanos' speech was on the following three topics. Shame, if I could hear one sound and one sound only for the rest of my life, dot, dot, dot. And your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Okay. And now I call upon our fifth finalist from St. Lawrence, Amy Norton Rumbo.
As Mr. Oh, sorry. As Mr. Saradaris has become quite a celebrity in today's finals, I'm going to quote him. Ladies and gentlemen, to rape, riot, and revolution, may prostitution prosper, and may every swear word become a household word. A direct quote from Mr. Achillea. Another thing that has been quite prominent in today's finals has been this topic of education, and how much is wrong with education. And I would like to extend this, as our previous speaker, Francesco, did. And what I'd like to tell you is that there's something going a bit wrong with education when such cynicism is allowed so that people are now allowed to say things such as, may prostitution prosper. Because what we see is that our society has become so fundamentally um, desensitized that such things have become a social norm. We have so many economic problems. We have so many problems of discrimination that now problems have become normal. But why are they not normal? Because society was never built to be discriminatory. People were made to be equal because society was never meant to exploit women and allow for prostitution. For these reasons, we think that this is disincentivization, which is why when Mr. Saradaris quoted to me that rape, riot, and revolution were okay, I flinched a bit, and I hope to God that all of you flinched when I said every swear word should become a household word, because really, realistically, that's not okay, because we need to try and help our society progress. How do you do that? By teaching people morals. What happens when you don't teach people morals? They think like Mr. Saradaris. They think that things like that are okay. And what happens then is that they don't pursue fun leisure activities, such as coming to Panhellenics, which Mr. Saradaris hasn't done. So ladies and gentlemen, if I could make one change in education, what I'd say is teach people to be human again. Teach them to have a little fun every now and then. Teach them that certain things in society are simply not acceptable. Teach them that we should not be saying cheers to rape, riot, and revolution. And most definitely, we should not be allowing children to go around swearing in their households. A place of sanctity, a place where good things should be encouraged. Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of Mr. Sarandaris, we should not do this. This is wrong. Do not disincentivize the population. This should not be to rape, riot, and revolution. Thank you. Amy's topic was, if I could make one change in education. And now our final finalist for impromptu from Anatolia, Nicoletta Alexopoulou.
ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing impromptu for a few years, and this means that I've seen a great deal of phrases in these three topics. Now, some of these three phrases are extremely trite and extremely stupid, and the one I have today isn't much better. The one phrase I see here is called, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it's a phrase that I've heard time and time again. It's a phrase that modern society uses to try to, 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 to prove to itself that it's not as commercialized as we think. It's what society uses to try and show its members that beauty is actually subjective and not objective. I beg to differ. Beauty is so, um, so um, it's defined in our society in such a rigid way so that it doesn't allow any deviation from the norm. You all know the norm, of course. The norm, I'm going to talk about women today because I'm a woman and I see lots of ladies here. And I think that this, is much, that this saying applies much more to women than it does to men. You all know the norm, as I told you. The norm is large breasts. The norm is blonde hair. The norm is being curvy, but just at the right amount. Because if you're too curvy, then you become fat. There's also another way to say this. I've heard beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I've also heard beauty is in the eye of the beer holder. Now, when the beholder also happens to be a beer holder, then apparently beauty is even more subjective. And that's apparently, that's apparently supposed to make us feel better. Still, as a female living in the modern 21st century, which isn't so modern, I'm going to explain to you, this doesn't really make me feel any better. It doesn't make me feel better to know that I'm always not, a, I'm not going to be con considered conventionally pretty because I'm not blonde and because my breasts aren't large enough. But still, I don't care if I feel well. I care about all other women in the world. And not, just, not to make this a motivational speech, but I think that we should bring back this saying because we use this. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beer holder or the beholder or whomever. But is it? Because when you have a male population that demands perfection from women, and not, not only even where looks are concerned, they want women to be smart, they want women to be pretty, they want women to be waxed everywhere. So, so honestly, it's really not that subjective at all. It's completely objective. Our standards have become too objective to fit in a modern society. And one would, ex one would expect, as society progresses, for these views to progress. These views are bordering on misogynistic. So, if I have to tell you something from today's debate, beauty is not in the eye of the beholder currently, but it should be. Thank you. Nicoletta's topic was beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And we have four honourable mentions for impromptu speaking. First of all, from St. Catherine, Zoe Kalos. From Mandulidis, Nicoletta Bacola. From Gitonas, Panos Yorgopoulos. And from St. Lawrence, Arietta Valma. Well done to all. I would like to thank the judges, April Wannis from ACS, Catherine Webster for Campion, and Laura Hunt from Hype. We will continue with oral interpretation, dramatic, in just two, two or three minutes, okay? Please don't go far away.
Ladies and gentlemen, they say every day you learn something new. And today I learned a couple of new things about Anatolia. We had this brilliant slide presentation which kept going on and on and on. And I found out some interesting facts. For example, in 1914, when the Turkish invaded Greece during World War I, this school had to close for three years. But then it reopened. And in 1940, during the Nazi invasion of Germany, this school was occupied and actually used by the Germans as a headquarters for the Balkan Wars. But then the school reopened. And so this school survived many hardships. But one thing which wasn't mentioned in the slide, which this school survived, and which we all survived, a hardship we sure overcame, was 21st of December 2012. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we all remember the movies that we had, 2012, how we brought up this whole, um, this whole uh, noise about the mind predictions that we, the world is going to end in 2012. And if I could travel back in time, I'd travel back to the Maya times and slap them. <laughs> because all this turmoil that we had, all, these, all this money pumped into movies to um, try and scare people that the world is going to end in 2012, this is just ridiculous. But you see, the point is, it's actually our fault. I mean, we as a human society, we try and predict things. We have statistics. We, we really are bad at it. Well, first of all, we already showed that the minds are really bad at it, but we ourselves are really bad at predicting future things. So we start being cautious of the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's why we were scared of 2012. That's why we, we, we weren't sure. We were scared that perhaps the minds were right and the world is going to end. That is why this one American citizen built a whole fortress somewhere uh, in the middle of nowhere to protect himself from a possible zombie, a zombie apocalypse. And that is why all these resources were spent to uh, protect um, the world from a meteorite, for example. And all these movies based upon meteorites and global cataclysm hitting the United States of America. But you know what? A couple of months ago, a meteorite did fall in Russia. Well, that was a waste, wasn't it? It fell somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And all the preparations that we had, the infrastructures to prevent meteorites, the um, media presentation to show the world that a, media, that a meteor will fall, we can prevent it, that was all pointless. And the reason is because we spend too much time thinking about the future. And if I was able to travel back in time, I'd tell those people, forget about the, all those issues, forget about the things which you can't predict and you think are going to happen in the future because you're scared. Think about the present. Think about now. We have many problems right now that we have to solve and face, whether it is economic crisis, whether it is substantial um, practical problems that we face today in society. Let's not think about the meteorite that will come again in 2025 and might pass by Earth or might not pass. Let's think about real problems, food shortages, economic crises, global warming that we have to prevent right now. And so if I were able to come back in time, travel back in time, I'd tell people not to fear the future. Thank you. Dennis's topic was, if I could travel back in time. Now I'd like to call upon our third finalist for impromptu speaking. It's from St. Catharines, Francesco Lavascio. This is 10 seconds of silence for all, for all of you guys, really, for all of the victims of competitive education, of a system which pushes you beyond your limits, a system which pushes you to perform in ways that you are not built to perform. An intellectual student will want to develop their ideas, will want to bring intellect further, not push themselves to compete with, with their peers, to hide their work from their peers, to be able to get further than him. 
We want a world of intercommunication. We want education to extend towards the students, not to extend to work towards a competitive workplace. Now, all this situation of competitive education, etc., makes me think of a, of a very good friend of mine, of what was actually my last year's debate partner, Mr. Sarandaris. He, he was coming here last year, and uh, he wanted to come here this year as well. He said, hey, we're going to come together and we're going to win Panhellenic's debate competition. But what happened was that he got an offer from the very competitive University of Cambridge. And what I think is that Girton College stole his soul. He didn't have a chance to come here and have fun and press a motion and have a laugh with his friends at the party last night. He had to stay home and study because they want you to perform better than everybody else. They want you to be above everybody else that's applying because otherwise their name is going to get damaged. I'm not, I'm not criticizing these institutions. I'm not criticizing the good education that is being offered by these institutions. What I'm criticizing is the mentality be behind these institutions. That education is about excelling above someone else, about scoring higher than what you can possibly score. Because what I believe is that humanity progresses by interaction and not by individual closed-in studying. I believe that in this age of the internet and of intercommunication, what education should be moving towards, Edu what education should be having an extension towards is intercommunication and interlinkage and understanding. Because what moves society forward is people discussing, is peer reviewing, is people arguing with each other like we're doing here today. And this is why education should meet these goals should meet the goals which bring forward society and not goals which create competitive students which cannot interact with their peers, which only want to excel above everybody else. And this is why I believe competitive education stole Aquila Saradari's soul, like he's go it's going to steal all of our souls probably. And this is why I believe the system has to change. Thank you. And Francesca's topic was extension. So now I'd like to call upon our fourth finalist from Moraiti Sano Sukaki. Ladies and gentlemen, I came up here today and in 30 seconds I had to choose between these three topics. Shame, if I could hear one sound and one sound only for the rest of my life, and your time is limited so don't waste it living someone else's life. And to be honest, I just couldn't choose. I wish I could talk about sounds being ashamed in a limited time or something like that, but I just, I just can't make sense of it. I just couldn't choose. And I couldn't choose, because I wasn't taught to choose. I was taught to want it all. And to be honest, I do want it all. And I do want to include all these three parts in my speech. Now, why is that? It's because society taught me to want it more. It's because I was raised in a world of pluralism, a world of greed, a world of want, and want, and want, and want, until your soul rots. So my point here is that nowadays we have become so greedy, so wanting, so demanding that we fail to see so many other things in life. As I said, I couldn't choose one of these three topics because I just wanted to combine them and make something impromptu-like out of them. And I couldn't. And that is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. Society nowadays is producing individuals who want it all. And I'm not just talking about 
wanting more shoes or wanting more friends. I'm talking about actually not being able to get satisfied. Just look at me. I'm wearing three, two belts, and I'm talking about three things at the same time. What I'm trying to say here is that this mentality is not leading us anywhere. We are filled in, with a world of individualistic citizens who miss out on so many other beauties of life. No, as it was stated in an oratory, we cannot be perfect, and we cannot have it all. You cannot be a perfect husband, a perfect businessman, a perfect sportsman, a perfect, a perfect orator. You cannot be everything. And that is the beauty of human nature. What I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't go crazy about being perfect, not go crazy about having it all. We're missing out on such beautiful things. And I'm not saying that we're becoming evil people like the Kardashians or Justin Bieber. <laughs> I'm just saying that we are missing out on things like hanging out with your friends, wasting some time, not choosing something, and then wondering, what if I had chosen the other one? I'm talking about being human. We can have it all, and that's the beauty of it. Thank you. So Thanos' speech was on the following three topics. Shame, if I could hear one sound and one sound only for the rest of my life, dot, dot, dot. And your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Okay. And now I call upon our fifth finalist from St. Lawrence, Amy Norton Rumbo. As Mr. Saradaris has become quite a celebrity in today's finals, I'm going to quote him. Ladies and gentlemen, to rape, riot, and revolution, may prostitution prosper, and may every swear word become a household word. A direct quote from Mr. Achillea. Another thing that has been quite prominent in today's finals has been this topic of education, and how much is wrong with education. And I would like to extend this, as our previous speaker, Francesco, did. And what I'd like to tell you is that there's something going a bit wrong with education when such cynicism is allowed so that people are now allowed to say things such as, may prostitution prosper. Because what we see is that our society has become so fundamentally um, desensitized that such things have become a social norm. We have so many economic problems. We have so many problems of discrimination that now problems have become normal. But why are they not normal? Because society was never built to be discriminatory. People were made to be equal because society was never meant to exploit women and allow for prostitution. For these reasons, we think that this is disincentivization. Which is why, when Mr. Saradaris quoted to me that rape, riot, and revolution were okay, I flinched a bit. And I hope to God that all of you flinched when I said every swear word should become a household word. Because really, realistically, that's not okay. Because we need to try and help our society progress. How do you do that? By teaching people morals. What happens when you don't teach people morals? They think like Mr. Saradaris. They think that things like that are okay. And what happens then is that they don't pursue fun leisure activities, such as coming to Panhellenic, which Mr. Saradaris hasn't done. So ladies and gentlemen, if I could make one change in education, what I'd say is teach people to be human again. Teach them to have a little fun every now and then. Teach them that certain things in society are simply not acceptable. Teach them that we should not be saying cheers to rape, riot, 
and revolution, and most definitely, we should not be allowing children to go around swearing in their households. A place of sanctity, a place where good things should be encouraged. Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of Mr. Sarandaris, we should not do this. This is wrong. Do not disincentivize the population. This should not be to rape, riot, and revolution. Thank you. Amy's topic was, if I could make one change in education. And now our final finalist for Impromptu from Anatolia, Nicoletta Alexopoulou. I've been doing impromptu for a few years, and this means that I've seen a great deal of phrases in these three topics. Now, some of these three phrases are extremely trite and extremely stupid, and the one I have today isn't much better. The one phrase I see here is called, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it's a phrase that I've heard time and time again. It's a phrase that modern society uses to try to, 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 to prove to itself that it's not as commercialized as we think. It's what society uses to try and show its members that beauty is actually subjective and not objective. I beg to differ. Beauty is so, um, so um, it's defined in our society in such a rigid way so that it doesn't allow any deviation from the norm. You all know the norm, of course. The norm, I'm going to talk about women today because I'm a woman and I see lots of ladies here. And I think that this is much, that this, saying applies much more to women than it does to men. You all know the norm, as I told you. The norm is large breasts. The norm is blonde hair. The norm is being curvy, but just at the right amount. Because if you're too curvy, then you become fat. There is also another way to say this. I've heard beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I've also heard beauty is in the eye of the beer holder. Now, when the beholder also happens to be a beer holder, then apparently beauty is even more subjective. And that's apparently, that's apparently supposed to make us feel better. Still, as a female living in the modern 21st century, which isn't so modern, I'm going to explain to you, this doesn't really make me feel any better. It doesn't make me feel better to know that I'm always not, I'm not going to be considered conventionally pretty because I'm not blonde and because my breasts aren't large enough. But still, I don't care if I feel well. I care about all other women in the world. And not, just, not to make this a motivational speech, but I think that we should bring back this saying because we use this. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beer holder or the beholder or whomever. But is it? Because when you have a male population that demands perfection from women, and not, not only even where looks are concerned, they want women to be smart. They want women to be pretty. They want women to be waxed everywhere. So, so honestly, it's really not that subjective at all. It's completely objective. Our standards have become too objective to fit in a modern society. And one would, ex one would expect, as society progresses, for these views to progress. These views are bordering on misogynistic. So if I have to tell you something from today's debate, Beauty is not in the other beholder currently, but it should be. Thank you. Nicoletta's topic was beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
And we have four honourable mentions for impromptu speaking. First of all, from St. Catherine, Zoe Kalos. From Mandulidis, Nicoleta Bacola. From Gitonas, Panos Yorgopoulos. And from St. Lawrence, Arietta Valma. Well done to all. I would like to thank the judges, April Wannis from ACS, Catherine Webster for Campion, and Laura Hunt from Hype. We will continue with oral interpretation, dramatic, in just two, two or three minutes, okay? Please don't go far away. For oral interpretation of literature comics, I would like to invite Mirka Karayani from Kostad's Gijuna School to present the finalists. Hello, good luck to everyone. The first finalist is from St. Lawrence School, number 388, Arieta Balmas. shouted Veruca Salt, the girl who got everything she wanted. Daddy, I want an Impalimpa. I want you to get me an Impalimpa right away. I want to take it home with me. Go on, Daddy, get me an Impalimpa now. No, no, my pet, her father said to her. We mustn't interrupt, Mr. Wonka. But I want an Impalimpa, screamed Veruca. All right, Veruca, all right, but I can't get it for you this second. Please be patient. I'll see you have one before the day's out. Now, let's keep up with Mr. Wonka. Is it really right that every single bit of blame and all the scolding and the shame should fall upon Veruca Salt? Is she the only one at fault? For though she's spoiled, and dreadfully so, a girl can't spoil herself, you know. So who spoiled her then? Ah, who in thee? Who pondered to her every need? Who turned her to such a brat? Who are the culprits? Who did that? Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Rod Dahl. Mr. Wonka rushed on down the corridor, the nut room. It said on the next door they came to. All right, said Mr. Wonka. Stop here for a moment and catch your breath and take a peek through the glass panel of the door. But don't go in, whatever you do. Don't go in, said the nut room. If you go in, you'll disturb this world. Everyone crowded around the door. Oh, look, Grandpa, look, cried Charlie. <gasps> Go there, shouted Veruca Salt. Weird, said Mike TV. It was an amazing sight. One hundred squirrels were seated upon high stools around a large table. 
on the table, there were mounds and mounds of walnuts, and the squirrels were all working away like mad, shelling the walnuts at a tremendous speed. These squirrels are specially trained for getting the nuts out of walnuts, Mr. Wonka explained. Why use squirrels? Mike TV asked. Why not use Oompa Loompas? Because, said Mr. Wonka, Oompa Loompas can't get walnuts out of walnuts out in one piece. They always split them in two. Nobody except squirrels can get walnuts home out of walnut shells every time. It is extremely difficult. But in my factory, I insist upon only whole walnuts. Therefore, I have used squirrels to do the job. Aren't they wonderful? The way they get those nuts out. And see how they first tap each walnut with their knuckles to be sure it's not a bad one. If it's a bad one, it makes a hollow sound. And they don't bother to open it. They just throw it down the rubbish chute. There, look. What's that squirrel near it up? I think he's got a bad one. They watched the little squirrel as he tapped the walnut shell with his knuckles. He cocked his head to one side, listening intently. Then suddenly, he threw the nut over his shoulder into a large hole on the floor. Hey, Mummy! shouted Rook Assault suddenly. I've decided I want a squirrel. Get me one of those squirrels. Don't be silly, sweetheart, said Mrs. Salt. These all belong to Mr. Wonka. I don't care about that, shouted Ruka. I want one. All I've got at home is two dogs and four cats and six bunny rabbits and two parakeets and three canaries and a green parrot and a turtle and a bowl of goldfish and a cage of white mice and a silly old hamster. I want a squirrel. <laughs> all right, my pet, Mrs. Salt said soothingly. Mummy will get you a squirrel just as soon as she possibly can. But I don't want any old squirrel, Veruca shouted. I want a trained squirrel. At this point, Mr. Salt, Veruca's father, stepped forward. <clears throat> Very well, Wonka, he said importantly, taking out a wallet full of money. How much do you want for one of these squirrels? Name your price. They're not for sale, Mr. Wonka answered. She can't have one, huh? Who says I can't, shouted Ruga. I'm going in there to get myself on this very minute. Oh, no, don't go in, said Mr. Wonka, but he was too late. The girl had already thrown open the door and rushed in. The moment she entered the room, 100 squirrels stopped what they were doing and turned their heads and stared at her with small, black, beady eyes. Veruca Salt stopped also and stared back at them. Then her gaze fell upon a pretty little squirrel sitting nearest her at the end of the table. The squirrel was holding a walnut in its paws. All right, Veruca said, I'll have you. She reached out her hands to grab the squirrel, but as she did so, in that first split second, when her hands started to go forward, there was a flash of brown lightning, and every single squirrel around the table took a flying leap towards her and landed on her body. Twenty-five of them caught hold of her right arm and pinned it down. Twenty-five more caught hold of her left arm and pinned that down. Twenty-five caught hold of her right leg and anchored it to the ground. Twenty-four caught hold of her left leg. And the one remaining squirrel, obviously the leader of them all, climbed up onto her shoulder and started tap, tap, tapping the wretched girl's head with its knuckles. Save screamed Mrs. Salt. Maruka, come! What are they doing to her? They're testing her to see if she's a bad nut, said Mr. Wonka. You won't. Veruca struggled furiously, but the squirrels held her tight and she couldn't move. The squirrel on her shoulder went tap, tap, tap in the side of her head with its knuckles. Then all at once, the squirrels pulled Veruca to the ground and started carrying her across the floor. My goodness, she is a bad nut after all, said Mr. Wonka. Her head must have sounded quite hollow. From far across the corridor came the beating of drums. Then the singing began. Veruca Sol sang the Oompa Veruca Sol, the little brute, has just gone down the garden chute. And as we very rightly thought, that in a case like this we ought to see the thing completely through, we've polished off her 
pa, re, si, and do 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 do. Thank you. Contestant, uh, the second contestant is from Haef, number 171, Ion Alexandropoulos. <laughs> I am a man. Not just that. I've been a man all my life, and I intend to keep it up too. <laughs> this book is a modest attempt at capturing the incredible wonder and glorious majesty of being a man in the 21st century. Most of the stories are specific to me, but hopefully that means they'll be specific to you as well. Whether you're a man yourself, or even if you've just met one once. Awkward Situations for Men by Danny Wallace. What follows pretty much represents the story of my life over the past year and a bit. A year in which I was discovered by my wife to be a secret pajama wearer. <laughs> a year in which I found myself naked in a shower with a stranger. Turned up to places too late turned up to places too early, discovered the finest sandwich known to man, found that staring at strangers' children is frowned upon, <laughs> and had a heated disagreement with a bishop. <laughs> but in among the trials and trips and stumbles and fumbles are moments of glorious triumph too. Those are the moments that make our awkward situations for men mine and yours and everyone else's, something close to worthwhile. Chapter 8, Walking. Never tiptoe behind a strange woman on a dark street at night. <laughs> this is what I'd been doing for the last 20 or 30 feet, and it really wasn't working out well at all. The problem is, I just don't know how to act on walking behind women at night. I hate it. I hate it so much, I would rather ban all women than have to walk behind one after dark. <laughs> That's right, ban them. <laughs> this woman and I had turned onto the same side street at the same time. It was a long road, and I was now technically following her. I hate this because I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot because I instantly assume this woman will feel intimidated by me. That she'll think I'm a crazy-eyed, knife-wielding loon, or a stalker, or someone who wants to talk to her about God. I tried to work out what I should do, and sped up, thinking perhaps I should overtake her, but then realized that would mean getting closer. And the last thing I wanted her to think was that I wanted to get closer. So I slowed down again and tried to come up with another plan. The problem, I think, is that as men, we know we are constantly under suspicion. In an ideal and crimeless world, we'd all walk around arm in arm, smiling and tipping our hats. 
we skipped gaily and stepped gingerly. But this was a street in North London approaching midnight. And as such, not somewhere I'd recommend skipping gaily or stepping gingerly. <laughs> Even to gay skippers or ginger steppers. <laughs> if only I had a balloon, I thought, inexplicably as I continued to follow this woman. If I had a balloon, she would look behind her and see a man with a balloon. <laughs> and who's ever been attacked by a man with a balloon? Who'd attack while holding a balloon? A balloon implies innocence and fun. It would suggest I had just been somewhere lovely. Perhaps a circus. Or maybe I was in the circus. What woman would look behind her at night and be horrified to realize that she was being followed by a huge clown? <laughs> Actually, that's most women, isn't it? Forget a balloon. And then a thought struck me. I could make a noise, a noise which would signal that I knew I was following her and that it didn't bother me in the least. A noise which would say, you and I, my lady, are simply travelers along the same path. I mean you no harm. And so I coughed <coughs> and then cleared my throat. <coughs> It was genius. <laughs> By showing her I was there, I was alerting her to the fact that I had nothing to hide. But I wasn't sure she'd heard it, so I coughed again, louder. <coughs> she appeared to speed up slightly. <laughs> this wasn't good. Now, she probably thought, I was a crazy-eyed, knife-wielding loon with a cough. And that was worse, because nobody wants a cough. I decided the best course of action would be to slow down a bit, and then keep as quiet as possible. And so, I began to tread as carefully as I could, virtually tiptoeing down the street. I made that weird nervous face you make when you're trying to be really quiet. <laughs> and then, she slowed down and stopped under a streetlight on the corner of the road, and she started to look in her purse. This annoyed me for two reasons. One, I now had no option but to overtake her. I couldn't very well stop when she did. That would look weird. And two, why was she looking in her purse under a streetlight when she knew she was being followed by a coughing, knife-wielding, Loon. I felt like running and bellowing at her just to teach her a lesson. What kind of society is it where women fail to be intimidated by coughing, knife-wielding loons? It's political correctness gone mad. And then I remembered that I was not a knife-wielding loon. As I got closer, not wishing to frighten her as I passed, I continued my slight tiptoe, complete with strange face. And that was when she turned around. Turned around to see a man walking up very quietly behind her and making a strange face. <laughs> we make eye contact. I see she is wearing earphones and has been completely oblivious to me the whole time. I turn right at the junction and walk up another street, quietly cursing myself for extending my journey by ten minutes, and cursing society for making a man feel this way. Why had I overcompensated for my gender? Why had I assumed she would think I was an attacker? Wouldn't simply not attacking her have been good enough? Why can't everyone be as trusting as me? When will we understand that strangers are just friends you haven't met yet? even at night. Sorry, mate, have you got a light? Says a stranger around the corner. He is about my size, and he too is a man. No, nope, I say, my voice suddenly higher than normal, and I scuffle away. As I walk, I keep looking behind me, just in case he's tiptoeing behind me while making strange faces. But he's miles away, and he just looks confused. Thank you.
The third contestant is from Costea Zintana School, number 302, Anastasis Merjanis. celebrate them every day. Wouldn't it be great to have a reason to celebrate every day? That's why I love on birthdays. The Mad Hatter's Tea Party by Walt Disney. There was once a Mad Hatter, a peculiar fellow, who lived in a strange little house in the woods of Wonderland. Nearby lived a friend of his. The March Hare. One day, the March Hare heard that it was the Mad Hatter's birthday, so he baked a birthday cake. Then down the woodland path he went, singing, "The very merriest birthday to you, the very merriest birthday to you." The Mad Hatter was delighted. He called his friend, the Dormouse, a sleepy little soul. And what a jolly time they all did have! They decided a birthday party was the best of all possible fun. Next day, the Mad Hatter kept thinking of that party. He did wish they could have another. The March Hare was thinking about it too. How he longed for another piece of birthday cake. And the sleepy dormouse wished for another cup of tea, but it was nobody's birthday that day. Oh, me! Said the March Hare. It really isn't fair. Only one birthday a year for each of us, and three hundred sixty-four odd birthdays. Three hundred sixty-four odd birthdays! Cried the Mud Hatter. Well, fine. Let's celebrate those. So they did. Every day, they had a non-birthday party. What fun! They would set up the table and hang up the decorations and have birthday cake and tea. And after the party, they would clear everything away. But that soon got tiresome, so they set up a great long table underneath the trees. After that, they never cleared anything away. Never think I'm messy. The mud hatter would call out, "Move down!" and the mud hare would call out, "Clean cup!" and away they would move to new places at the table. And every day they happily sung, "A very merry and birthday to you! A very merry and birthday to you!" All that moving. Got to be too much for the sleepy dormouse. Since he was so fond of tea, he just chose himself a teapot, climbed in, and stayed. Now and then he would open a drowsy eye and join in a bit of fun. One day, a little girl named Alice wandered into Wonderland. As she walked by herself through the Wonderland woods, seeing most unusual sights, she began to hear singing off through the trees. 
It sounds like a birthday party, she thought. So she hurried along to see. In through the mud had his gates to step. She saw the colored lanterns hanging from the tree and the cakes upon the table. And she heard the jolly song. A very merry and birthday to you. To who? A very merry and birthday to you. Then the Mad Hatter saw her. No room, he cried. What are you doing here? I heard a singing for the world, said Alice. And it sounded so delightful. It is, cried the Mad Hatter. What a charming child. Sit down, sit down. Whose birthday is he, eh? Alice asked. No one's. It's an old birthday party, they said and explained. Why then, it's my own birthday too, Alice said. A very merry own birthday to you, chorus the mud hat and the mud chair. My? said Alice. I wish Dinah were here to see this. And who's Dinah? the mud chair asked. Dinah is my cat. Cat? a horrified voice, and the dormouse, at the sound of that dreaded word, popped out of the teapot, up into the air. Would you like some more tea? The Mad Hatter asked Alice. How can I have more? asked Alice. When I haven't had any yet. Move down, cried the macho just then. Green cup! Move down! scolded the Hatter rudely pushing Alice out of her chair. This is the silliest party I've ever seen, said Alice. I'm going home. She stopped at the gate and off through the woods. No one seemed to notice that she had left. There they are, singing to this very day, drinking cups of one birthday tea. If you should wander through Wonderland, Perhaps you will hear voices singing, loud and free. A very merry young birthday to you. To who? A very merry young birthday to me. Thank you. The fourth contestant from Hive, uh, number 193, Alexandra <laughs> Paisano. What my sister Helen has gone and done now. She's run off with that Paris. She's a sly one, that Helen. Husband Menelaus is away from the palace and she shuts up young Paris. Disgusting, I call it. You'd never catch me flirting with a guest. Of course, I've got three kids to worry about. I have to set them a good example. Anyway, they reckon she's off to some place called... Troy? Still, it's better than Sparta. Nasty place at Sparta. I always knew she would never stick it out. There'll be trouble, I tell you. Mark my words. We all know the story of Helen of Troy, but what about her sister, Clytemnestra? If she had kept a diary of those exciting years, would it have looked something like this? 
Diary of a Murderess by Terry Deary. Dear Diary, my husband Agamemnon came storming in tonight. Have you heard what your sister Helen has gone and done now? He says, I've heard. Can't say I blame her. Nice guy, that. Paris. I knew this would upset him. I won't have him say a word against Helen. She's always been flighty, but she is my sister. Nice guy. He was a guest, a guest. He betrayed the trust of Menelaus. Stole his wife. No need to shout. You're upset if you deny her. What's wrong with him, Mom? If Janiya asks, your auntie Helen has gone off with a nice bring Terry. I said, oh, is that all? If Janiya said, and returned to her sewing. Lovely girl, if Janiya. I wish our other two, Orestes and Electra, were as good. Those two are so strange. Anyway, Agamemnon says, there will be trouble. Big trouble. They reckon we will get a thousand ships and sail after her. Bring her back. That'll take months. A Greek's got to do what a Greek's got to do. <laughs> now let me have my dinner and I'll be off to organize the army. Organize the army? Don't tell me you're going as well. Going? Going? I'm leading the whole expedition. Menelaus is my brother, after all. Okay, that's Agamemnon all over. Getting into somebody else's fight just so he can have an excuse to go off and play battle leaves me here stuck for months on end. It would serve him right if I did what Helen did and found myself a little boy toy. In fact, I've had my eye on that of Gestas for a while now. But no, if Janiya would be upset, I'll let Agamemnon get on with it. I hope he gets seasick. Two months later. Dear diary, I'll never forgive Agamemnon. I knew he had problems. The ships were waiting to sail to Troy, and they couldn't even get out of the harbor. The winds kept blowing them back, week after week after week. I also knew that they wanted the oracle to ask for advice. He was very quiet when he came back. Well, what do you have to do? I asked. Uh, uh, he muttered. What? Uh, just a small sacrifice in the goods will extend the winter rounds. Oh, that's all right then. What is it? A sheep? A deer? He muttered something and began to leave the room. What was that? A maiden. Oh, shame on you, Agamemnon! You're not going to kill a poor, innocent little girl just to get that useless Helen, are you? A Greek's got to do. Yes, I know what a Greek's got to do. I just think it's a wicked shame. I feel sorry for the poor girl's mother, that's all. I was so upset. So I sent for Janiya to cheer me up. Her nurse was as pale as a marble statue when I called her. If it's enough, go on to the sacrifice, ma'am, she said. Go on to the sacrifice? She's too young to be watching things like that. She'll be upset. She won't have any of her dinner. She won't be having any dinner anymore, ma'am. If it's enough, go on for the sacrifice, ma'am. She is the sacrifice, ma'am. I was speechless. The double-crossing, silly rat of a husband had killed our little girl on the altar just so he could go off and play soldier. I'll kill him. If I had a sword, I would have killed him then and there. Of course, the winds changed, and he set sail before I could get my hands on him. So, I'll have to wait. But, oh yes, I can wait. Believe me, I'll have my revenge. Five years later. Dear diary, it's not as easy taking over Troy as I'd expected. Sitting outside the walls every day. They must be bored out of their tiny little minds. I was bored myself, actually. But now I've got that nice, sensible Aegisthus to keep me company. Sensible enough not to go to Troy. It'll serve like a man right if he gets killed. 
And now I've got a Eustace to help me, so it's certain the old fool will get killed if it does get home. As for the funny couple, sometimes I think they don't love their own mother at all. That's okay, though, because I don't really think much of them either. Another five years later. Dear Diary, so he's back. The conquering hero's home. Couldn't beat the Trojans in a fair fight, so you beat them with a trick horse or something. Typical snaky trick of Agamemnon. Poor Helen's back with Menelaus, and everybody is happy except me. Oh, and the Trojans, of course. I pretended to welcome Agamemnon back like a loving wife, didn't I? But it was difficult when that girl stepped forward. This is Cassandra, he said. Isn't that the king of Troy's daughter? She isn't. She's my wife-to-be. Hello! You've got a wife! You've got me! Cassandra will be my second wife, he said, and march into the palace. They say she's got the gift of prophecy. Well, in that case, she knows we're killing her, too. The next day. Dear diary, it's done. He's dead. It was so messy. Cassandra was in her room, waiting as if she expected me. Still, it's over now. Oh, yes, and Electra and Orestes have had their heads together hatching some kind of plot. They can't do anything, though. It's a case every go law of God or man to kill your own mother. I'm safe. I think. Thank you. There are two honorable mentions, one from Piers, number 142, Yuli Piligava, and the second from Haef, number 207, Gerasimina Voya. Thank you. Uh, I wish you would stay in your seats for just one minute. I won't keep you very long. Please listen. I'd like to thank the judges, first of all, John Blasaras from Oretis, Angelos Klonaris from Anatolia, Sofia Nikolovaki from Mandulidi School. At this time, I would like to say a formal goodbye to the Arsakio School of Patras as they have a long trip ahead and they're going to set off on their journey. Have a very safe trip to the coach and to the students. We hope you've enjoyed the tournament and hope to see you in many future tournaments. There will now, please listen. There will now be, it says in my notes, a short lunch break, but I see that we're right on time, so it will be a normal lunch break. Um, please be back at 1.30 sharp for debate finals. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Someone has just given me a ring. If someone has lost a ring, for oral interpretation of literature, dramatic, I would like to invite Stephanie Stafford from St. Lawrence College to present the finalists. Stephanie? Hi. The first finalist for dramatic oral interp from Mandulivis, Eratophis Adibu.
timekeeper. Oh. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and thus we sit together now, and all night long she has not stared. The Lover by James Wood She was glad of the lake. Its soft, dark water helped to soothe and quiet her mind. She felt at peace alone, unhindered and free, free to do nothing but watch and listen and dream. London, Paris, New York, names, only names, names that had once meant excitement, then boredom, then frustration, then slavery, names that had brought her to the edge of her breakdown and left her doubting her own sanity. But here, everything was at peace. The lake, the trees, the cottage. And she was at one with them. Here she could stay for the rest of her life. Here, she would be happy to die. Across the sun heard a darkening filter of cloud, and in the east there was a thunder. Quickly, she gathered her things together and made for the cottage. Saw then, and breathless, she ran for the cottage door, and as she opened it, the storm burst. And there, on the hearth, gaunt and unwelcome, stood a man. Hello? It was an odd way to greet a complete stranger who had invaded her home, but it was all she could think of to say. A casual greeting to someone who seemed to be expecting her, waiting for her. I suppose you had to shelter from the storm too? She asked. The man said nothing. She ought to have been angry at this rude intrusion on her privacy, but anger somehow seemed pointless. It was as if the cottage was his, the hearth was his, and she had come out of the storm to seek, re to seek refuge at his door. She watched him cautiously waiting for an explanation. He said nothing, not a word. Did you get wet? She asked. He stood, huddled by the open fire, gazing at the dying embers. His eyes followed her. She moved to take off her coat and brush out her hair. The words spoken by him in a quiet, toneless voice took her by surprise. And from her form, withdraw the dripping cloth and show. I let her soiled glove by, untied her hat, I let the damp hair fall. Poetry. He was quoting poetry. He looked vaguely like a poet, with a certain bitterness in his eyes and hopelessness in his form. Yet that were not his lines. They were somehow familiar. Surely she had heard them before. Did you write that? She asked, forcing herself to make a conversation. He smiled, but did not answer. As she watched him, she had the feeling that he let himself into the cottage knowing that she would return. He'd been waiting for her, expecting her. She was sure of it, and for the first time, she was afraid. She knew she'd never make it to the village, and no one would hear if she cried out. She was alone, completely alone, with this frighteningly silent stranger. A sudden renting sound outside made her jump, a splintering of wood followed by crashing to the ground. It tore the alp tops down for spite, and did its worst to vex the lake. That poem again! That, that same poem! What was it? Why did it fit the scene so perfectly, and why couldn't she remember it? What an awful wind, she said as casually as possibly. Perhaps I ought to make sure that 
She had been working her way towards the door when she turned and slowly shook his head. She stopped, hypnotized, unable to take another step away from him. Destiny, her mind told her. This is your destiny, what you were created for. No matter where you went, you had to return here, to this cottage, to this man. Quietly, he walked towards her, past her, and on towards the heavy oak door. The key twisted in the lock, the shutters closed silently. Gently, very gently, he took her arm and led her back to the hearth and the blazing fire. They were alone, and she wanted to scream, but she couldn't. At last, she sat down by my side and called me that poem again! That damn poem! How did it go? Please, please let her remember! When no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare. His left arm held her tightly, the slender fingers biting into her skin while his right hand caressed the softness of her fair hair. But passion sometimes could prevail. A sudden thought of one so pale for love of her. Love? This wasn't love. This was madness. Insanity. She was crazy. Be sure I looked up at her eyes. His own eyes shone with a manical fervor. Happy and proud, at last I knew. Porphyria worshipped me. Porphyria, Browning's poem. She knew it! Oh my God! No! 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 That moment she was mine. Mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. She wanted to scream. She tried to scream, but she couldn't. His fingers were about her throat, and no sound emerged. She fought for air, but she could feel her body falling, falling. Her mind struggled to escape from the darkness, but all she could hear was a voice, a distant voice, fading, ecstatic. And all her hair, hair, in one long yellow string I wound, Three times a little throat around and strangled her. Thank you. Our second finalist from Anatolia. Alexandra Kulusi. The ailing ten-year-old Conradin, living with a strict, overprotective Mrs. Dirop, finds relief 
and then release from her oppression through his vengeful, merciless God creation. Shretni Vashta by Saki H. H. Munro. Conradin was 10 years old, and the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy would not live another five years. The doctor's opinion was endorsed by Mrs. De Rupp, who counted for nearly everything. Mrs. De Rupp was Conradin's cousin and guardian, and would never, in her honestest moments, have confessed to herself that she disliked Conradin, though she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his good was a duty which she did not find especially bothersome. In a dull, cheerless garden, overlooked by so many windows that were ready to open with a message not to do this or that, or a reminder that medicines were due, he found little attraction. In a forgotten corner, however, almost hidden behind a dismal shrubbery, was a disused tool shed of respectable proportions, and within its walls, Conradin found a haven. In the gloom stood a big hutch, the abode of a large polecat ferret. Conradin was dreadfully afraid of the lithe, sharp-fanged beast, but it was his most treasured possession. Its very presence in the tool shed was a secret and fearful joy to be kept from the knowledge of the woman. And one day, out of heaven knows what material, he spun the beast a wonderful name. And from that moment, it grew into a god and to religion. Every Thursday, in the dim and musty silence of the tool shed, he worshipped with mystic and elaborate ceremonial before the wooden hutch would dwelt Shretni Vashta, the great ferret. After a while, Conrad's absorption in the tool shed began to attract the notice of his guardian. It is not good for him to be pottering down there in all weathers, she promptly decided. In the shed that evening, there was an innovation in the worship of the Hatch God. Conradin had been wont to chant his praises, but tonight he asked a boon. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashta. The thing was not specified. If Shredni Vashta was a god, he must be supposed to know. And every night in the welcome darkness of his bedroom, and every evening in the dusk of the tool shed, Conrad's bitter litany went up. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashta. Mrs. De Rupp noticed that the visits to the shed did not cease. And one day, she made a further journey of inspection. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? She asked. I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them all cleared away. Conradin shut his lips tight. But the woman marched down to the shed complete her discovery. It was a cold afternoon, and Conradin had been told to keep to the house. He saw the woman enter and fervently preached his prayer for the last time. And in the sting and misery of his defeat, he began to chant loudly and defiantly the hymn of his threatened title. Shredni Vashta went forth. His 
thoughts were red thoughts, and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Shredni Vasta, the beautiful. And then of a sudden, he stopped his chanting and drew closer to the window pane. The door of the shed still stood ajar as it had been left. And the minute was slipping by. Hope had crept by inches into his heart, and presently his eyes were rewarded. Out through that doorway came a long, low, yellow and brown beast with eyes that blink at the waning daylight and dark, wet blood stains around the fur of jaws and throat. Conradin dropped on his knees. The great polecat ferret made its way down to a small brook at the foot of a garden, drank for a moment, then crossed a little plank bridge and was lost to sight in the bushes. Such was the passing of Shretni Vashta. Tea's ready, said a foul-faced maid. Where's the mistress? She, she went down to the shed some time ago, said Conradin. And while the maid went to summon her mistress to tea, Conradin listened to the noises and silences which fell in quick spasms beyond the dining room door, the scuttering footsteps and hurried embassies for outside help. And then, after a laugh, the scared sobbing and the shuffling tread of those who bore a heavy burden into the house. Whoever will break it to the poor child? I couldn't for the life of me, exclaimed a shrill voice. While they debated the matter among themselves, Conradin smiled to himself and thanked his secret cause. Thank you. Our third finalist. From Piers, Sergius Dinopoulos. The heroic and elegiac song for the lost second lieutenant of the Albanian campaign by Odysseus Elitis, translated by Kimen Fryer. There where the sun first dwelt where the weather opened with the virgin's eyes, as the air from the shaking of an almond tree snowed, and the horsemen blazed up on the tips of vegetation. There, where the hoof of a fearless plane tree struck, and a flag fluttered earth and water on high, where weapons 
never burden the backs of men, but all the toil of the sky, all the world shone like a water drop in the morning at the foot of the mountain. Now agony stoops with bony hands, takes and smothers the flowers upon her one by one in gorges where water stopped. The songs lie down famished for joy. Monk rocks with cold hair silently cut the consecrated bread of desolation. High up the vultures share the breadcrumbs of the sky. Now in the muddy waters an agitation rises. The wind seized by the foliage blows its dust far away. Fruits spit out their pits. Earth hides her stones, fear digs a hole and scurries into it. In that hour when from the bushes of the sky the howl of the wolf cloud scatters on the hide of the field the tempest tremors and then spreads, spreads the pitiless snow, the snow and then goes winning over the fasting valleys, and then sets men to hailing one another, fire or the sword. For those who set out with fire or the sword, evil will flame up here. Let the cross despair not, only let violets say their prayers far from the cross. For them night was a more bitter day. They melted iron, chewed earth, their gods smelled of gunpowder and mule hide. Every thunderbolt was death astride the air. Every thunderbolt a man smiling on the other side of death. And let fate say what it will. Suddenly the moment missed its mark and found courage facing the sun. It threw splinters into it, Binoculars, telemeters, mortars, froze. The air tore as easily as calico. The stones opened as easily as lungs. The helmet rolled from his left side. The roots in the earth were startled only for a moment. Then the smoke scattered and the day went timidly as to deceive the tumult from the infernal regions. But the night half rose like a trodden viper when death for a moment paused beneath his teeth, then suddenly flowed into his pallid fingertips. He lies down now on his scorched battle coat with a halted breeze on his quiet hair, with a twig of forgetfulness in his left ear. He resembles a garden from which the birds have suddenly flown. He resembles a song muzzled in the darkness. He resembles the clock of an angel stopped just when the eyelashes said, So long, boys. And amazement turned into stone. He lies down now on his scorched battle coat. The black centuries around him bark with the skeletons of dogs at the dreadful silence. And the hours that have become stone pigeons again listen with attention. But laughter was scorched. But the earth was deafened. But no one heard his very last shriek. All the world was emptied with his last shriek. Under five cedar trees, with no other candles, he lies on his scorched battle coat. The helmet empty, the blood muddy, at his side the half-finished arm, and between his eyebrows a small, bitter well, fingerprint of fate. A small, bitter, black, red well, well where memory grows cold.
cold. Oh, do not see, oh, do not see from where his, from where his life has fled. Do not say how, do not say how the smoke of the dream rose high. In this way, then, the one moment, in this way, then, the one, in this way, then, the one moment, abandoned the other, and the eternal sun, in this way, suddenly left the world. Sun, were you not the eternal one? Bird, were you not the moment of joy that never rests? Brightness, were you not the fearlessness of cloud? And you, garden, music hall of flowers, and you, curling root, flute of the magnolia tree, just as the tree shakes itself in the rain, and the empty body blackens from fate, and a crazy man battles with the snow, and both eyes are on the point of tears. Why, the eagle asks, where is that brave young man? And all the eagles wonder where that brave young man might be. Why, the mother asks, where is my son? And all the mothers wonder where their boy might be. And why, the companion asks, where might my brother be? And all his companions wonder where the youngest of all might be. They grasp snow, the fever burns. They grasp the hand that it freezes. They try to bite bread, but it drips with blood. They look at the sky far away, but it blackens. Why, 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 why should death not bring us warmth? Why such unholy bread? Why a sky such as this, where once the sun dwelt? Our fourth finalist from St. Lawrence College, Tamsin Paternoster. Have you ever wondered what you'd do if you won the lottery? My mum won. She did, really. Okay. She didn't win the jackpot. We didn't live in a great big mansion. I wouldn't want to even if mum had won Mega Millions. I'd hate to live in a big house with heaps of rooms. I'd like a really small house. A caravan. And me and mum and Kenny would jump into the purple Ferrari permanently hooked onto the caravan and whiz off at hundreds of miles per hour if anyone, anyone ever got through. And we'd be safe. Then, we'd be safe. Lola Rose by Jacqueline Wilson in memory of Zoe Buller. Mum didn't win the lottery on the television. She won with a scratch card. I'm not talking 10 pounds, though. 10,000. Up until the day Mum won the lottery, 
We were always strapped for cash. Mum had to stop modelling when she got married because, because Dad didn't like it. And Mum understood. You don't argue. Not with my dad. I wondered if Mum was going to tell Dad about the lottery money. I knew we should keep our mouths zipped. But Mum could be silly when it came to dealing with Dad. She'd do anything for him. Give him exactly what he wanted. Do exactly what he said. And, and, that, and that was silly because, because my dad, well, I cried a lot as a baby. And it got on my dad's nerves, so he cleared off once or twice. And then Mum cried a lot, too. She loved him. She did, even though he'd started to hit her. He would hit her, and hit her, and hit her. And she would hit back at first, but, but then he would hit harder. One night, Dad thought Mum was flaunting herself when they went out this club, and he, and he hit her when they got home. At that point, he'd start to hit her if a man so much as looked at her. He thought she had all these boyfriends behind his back. He'd asked me about it over and over. He shouted with his face up close, so his spit sprayed all over me. I told him, Mum only had eyes for him. But he wouldn't believe me. And he would hit her, and hit her, and hit her, even though she was pregnant with Kenny. Dad was okay for a bit after Kenny was born. We've got a photo taken on the day at the seaside, and Dad's got baby Kenny on his shoulders, a little skinny knee either side of his cheeks. Kenny looks scared stiff, but he's clinging grimly to Dad's long hair. And Dad loved having a son. He did. I wish I were as little as Kenny. He always hid under his bed, clamping his hands over his ears so he couldn't hear. So he couldn't hear Dad stomping. So he couldn't hear Mum trying to muffle her screams. So he couldn't hear him throw her against the bed. I had to listen. He used to make me listen, even though I couldn't bear it. And, and, and when he was finished, he would storm off out again. I would run to Mum. I always wondered if I should call an ambulance. I didn't know how to use the phone, but but I could count, and, and it didn't seem that hard when Dad did it. Mum wouldn't be able to speak because her mouth was all bloody and swollen. But she would always shake her head when she saw me pick up the phone. She'd been in hospital plenty of times, but she never told on Dad. She always said he tripped or walked into a lamppost. Mum, don't tell him. Don't tell Dad about the lottery money. I begged her. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm keeping quiet. Lick zip. She tossed the money in the air. It fluttered like big blue butterflies, sticking in her hair, catching on her clothes, landing on the carpet. That night, Dad found out about the lottery money. I wanted to be brave, but I couldn't help squealing. I didn't make much noise, and he raised his hand at me, but, but Mum came running. She saw us. She saw Dad's hand in the air. She saw me ducking. Get to bed, Jamie, Mum said. I'm staying here. It's you! You spoil everything! Even a lovely thing like Mum winning the lottery is all spoiled because of you and your shouting and your hitting! I knew you'd be like this! Why can't you be a real dad? Dad's head jerked as if I'd hit him. He stood still, shaking his head, as if he couldn't quite work it out. I think that's why he hit me. He didn't know what else to do. It was a flap. 
but lifted me off my feet. Mum leapt at Dad, scratching his face with her long nails. He punched her, and when she was on the ground, he kicked her. Then he walked and slammed the door behind him. Oh, oh Janie, look at you, said Mum, kneeling beside me. I'm okay. He hit you more. Much, much more. Come on, sweetheart. We've got to be quick. I need you to help me pack. What? I stared at Mum. She cupped my burning face in her hands. We're not staying. Now he's started on you, he won't stop. And, and I'm not having that. We're running away. We'll get away. You, me, and Kenny. A completely fresh start. So, come on. Thank you. We have two honorable mentions from St. Lawrence College, Theodora Terny and again from St. Lawrence College, Natalia Vori. I'd like to thank the judges, Sissi Arsanoglu from Utonet, Effie Yanakuri from Hype, and Wendy Rykopoulos from St. Catherine. Um, the, let me introduce the judges, first of all. The judges today are going to be Mr. Russell Quartz as chair, Ms. Ann Peters, Mr. Harrington, Mr. Angelakos, Miss Fern Liliani, Mr. Stratis, and myself, I'm Helen Colliais. Thank you very much, judges. Um, and the two teams, I hope, are here. So, for the proposition, we would like to ask Moraitis, please, to take the stage. Best speakers are Mirko Blazaki, Maria Rusi, and Tatiana Roboti. And for the opposition, we have the team from Hive. And their speakers are Andreas Athanasopoulos, Eliza Gritzi, and Christiana Papadaki. Uh, and the motion before them is that this House believes that there should be no restrictions on the freedom of speech. Good luck to both teams. Ladies and gentlemen, friends on both sides, we live in a society where really we would not like to revive the dark ages. We would not like to have any restrictions in the freedom of speech. And as team proposition, we will actually base our case on three main points, on three main areas of argument. Because these areas justify exactly our urge and our initiative to act now. First of all, we're going to prove to you why we're justified to do so. Secondly, we're going to prove to you the benefits. And thirdly, we're going to prove to you the moral obligations. 
But before doing so, please allow me to set the grounds for this debate by defining the motion before us, which is pretty obvious. By talking about freedom of speech, we talk about opinions being expressed. We do not talk about data or information concerning national security, for instance. We're purely talking about opinions held by people and which can be expressed freely. By no restrictions, we mean that every person is able to say whatever, to express whatever opinion is his without any repercussions on behalf of the government, any legal repercussions. And this will be the case for people over 18 year olds, meaning adults. Therefore, obviously, we're talking about cases like hate speech, political sarcasm, religious sarcasm, etc., etc. No, thank you, Matt. But before, uh, but without further ado, now moving on to what I'm going to talk to you about, which is why we're justified to do, to do so, and secondly, what are the benefits of our model. Wow. Now, moving on, no, thank you, ma'am. Now, moving on to the first area. Why are we justifiable? First of all, restrictions, ladies and gentlemen, are unnecessary. We live in a world, we're in societies, where the vast majority of people has, has actually central point, views. No, thank you, sir. Therefore, the fact that restrictions exist, by, by definition, only refer to a small minority, which are the edges and, and, and the fringes of our society, ladies and gentlemen. The majority does not go out in the road and act and offensively uh, and, uh, and actively offend people, ladies and gentlemen, religious, religions, etc., etc. No, thank you, madam. Therefore, what we're actually doing with, with uh, having regulations is that we're trying to have a law for people that it wouldn't work anyway. Why? Because what's the role of having a law? One, to deter, and two, to punish. Does these, does these law and this restriction actually achieve any of the two? No. Why? Because these people are not deterred in the first place. They would express their, um, their, uh, their hate and their uh, uh, opinions anyway. Madam. And secondly, no, thank you, madam. Do we, do, does punishment actually have any value here? To which we answer no. Why? Because our goal is not to punish these people after having committed the deed. Our point. goal, no thank you madam, is to have prevent them. And ladies and gentlemen, even if we punish On them, point, no thank you madam, if, even if we punish them as a state, this doesn't mean uh, that the tension will be diffused. These people might very well, uh, no thank you madam, have the consequences of opposing groups. Therefore, our, our uh, as a government imposing a punishment doesn't really mean that these people get uh, that the, uh, the opposing group gets the justice that it wants to. It will impose the justice that it feels is, is necessary. Moving That's on to the second point, no, thank you, madam. How it is unfair. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Murdoch, who is an international newspaper tycoon, actually owns 20% of the Arabic channel Rotana. This channel, in fact, broadcasts hate speech against the American Christianity. However, there have been no effects on him. On the other hand, in Egypt right now, we had a person being condemned to death and uh, not being here in this, jury, in this trial, actually, for having produced an anti-Islamic field. What do you see the, the, the fairness here? What we see is that although, for instance, certain groups are entitled to certain treatment, other groups are not. And thirdly, in this area of argument, arbitrariness. Are there any logical criteria upon which these, no, thank you, sir, these restrictions are actually decided? No. We have a denial of Holocaust in the USA, for instance, whereas the denial of the Armenian genocide is, not, is, not, is actually not existent. Therefore, what we have is that we deny some facts, we don't talk about some facts, while we are free to talk about others, whereas their status should have been the same. Now, moving on to the second areas of argument, which is why it is beneficial. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, by having no restrictions on freedom of speech, we expose all ideas. We bring them all to the forefront madam. and we allow the majority... Yes, ma'am. Do you think that the Pakistani people attacked by Golden Door are expressing their opinion and therefore leading to public discourse? Madam, the point is that actually even the Golden Dawn, uh, the, the, the Pakistani people who are expressing, uh, who are who are not expressing their opinions, are not expressing their opinions, but they are only a small minority and they are, uh, they are illegal. Uh, therefore, this is, not a, this is not a problem of our model. This is a, a different problem that is not applicable. Now, moving on to, uh, to our case here, uh, which is the benefits, actually. We expose all ideas and we bring them to the forefront. So what happens is that we stop these people from preaching to the core. We stop, we stop, no thank you madam, we stop uh, their, their voice from being escalated and escalated because we allow constructive dialogue and we allow disagreement as well. What is more, what we are doing is that we educate
educate people. As Hannah Arendt said, as the philosopher Hannah Arendt said, the most evil is done by people who have not chosen to be good or evil. The most evil is not done by these people who express the extremist ideas, but by the vast majority of people who refuse to take a stand and remain All neutral. Through our model, no, thank you, sir, by bringing these extreme voices to the forefront, what we're actually doing is that we're giving an incentive and we're urging the people to take an active stand on this, on this matter, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, what happens is that we cause our people to, to, to think more critically and indirectly become more educated on matters of their lives. So, ladies and gentlemen, what has Team Proposition told you today? We have proven the two basic grounds on why our motion stands. Our motion stands because we're both justified to take the measure and because our measure will be beneficial. Whereas my partner, Maria, will come up here and talk to you about how times, modern times, actually uh, give us the, the moral obligation as a government to act uh, and, in fact, um, uh, correct the imbalance that exists. So, for all those reasons, this side of the House, Team Proposition, begs to propose. Killing Jews is worship that brings us closer to Allah. This was printed on the side of buses in San Francisco two weeks ago, and it was immediately removed. Because, as what UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, freedom of speech should be protected and not abused. We are here opposing this motion. So, today we're going to come to you with three main arguments. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you to our duty to protect. Secondly, I'm going to analyze the restrictions, how restrictions prevent harm. And then my second speaker, Eliza, will come up here and will elaborate on how it undermines public discourse. And before I move on to my constructive case, please let me rebut some of the main points brought up until now. So they told us in our principle about how it's justified that it has to deter and punish. And they told us that they would express opinions anyway. And that, in fact, is not true from the moment that you do have these laws. Because you see that from the moment that you have these laws, you can't publish books, you can't publish articles, you can't be on the news broadcast. We see that this, by default, will deter you from having less conversations. They will deter you from publishing less than definitely. And then it as to the punishment, that this is, in fact, the mechanism with which they are deterred, ladies and gentlemen. This is why they will be deterred in the first place. And then they told us in the effectiveness that, quite simply, you bring opinions to the forefront. You bring opinions to this Holocaust denial in, in the open. And we tell you, and in fact, that somehow you're going to have all this debate around this. And we tell you that so much conversation does not, in fact, happen with any members of the Golden Dawn Age. We tell you that, in fact, this was clearly shown in the elections, since even though Golden Dawn was scrutinized, they still got a huge percentage, ladies and gentlemen. We tell you, no, thanks, that this doesn't, in fact, work in many cases, because no one actually will go to the library to research on this, uh, on this topic. No one will actually try to look in more to this issue. And therefore, it doesn't truly educate anyone. No, thank you, because you never really hear the counter-argument in most cases. Now, let's move on to the first argument about our duty to protect. The state has the right to restrict rights in order to protect individuals and society. Oh, we need to find, no thank you, a balance between rights and when rights of one infringe the rights of another. We should especially protect the rights and safety of those most vulnerable in our society who are not able to protect themselves. Which is why in a democratic society we accept that the majority rules have not at the detriment of minority rights. This is the only way to ensure a universal standard of protection for our society. Well, the question is, where do you draw this line? To what extent is it legitimate to restrict a right and when? Well, what we apply is the principle of proportionality. So, what is proportionality? It means that we restrict a right as much and only as much oh, necessary. Point, no, thank you. And we need in order to achieve the desired outcome. And we bring you the example of how you can drive a car. You have the right to do so. However, there are restrictions on the speed at which you can do so, so we can prevent the risk of an accident. We bring you the example on how you have the right to operate a factory, how we still restrict the degree to which you can pollute because we want, no thank you, we want to protect the environment. So how does this apply to freedom of speech? Well, we accept that everyone has the right to freedom of speech. However, we believe that it, it should be restricted only when and only to the extent to which we can ensure 
the safe and equal coexistence of people in society and the capacity of society to function. Therefore, point, no thank you, in a moment actually, freedom of speech should be restricted in cases where the harm to individuals and society is significant enough to threaten that safe coexistence. Yes, ma'am. We see actually that different societies have different restrictions. So what restrictions actually do you refer to in your model? We're talking about restrictions that in fact have a harm, ladies and gentlemen, a direct harm that can be prevented through these restrictions. And now we're going to talk to you exactly the harms that are created by complete and absolute uh, freedom of speech. So that's in fact my label. Um, and unrestricted speech, ladies and gentlemen, leads to active harms directly and indirectly. Well, just to be clear, speech can be harmful in various degrees, which is why applying the principle of proportionality which we support is so important, and regulation on speech should vary, according, should vary accordingly. So A, how speech can cause a direct harm. Well, this is the case with incitement of violence, where the speaker actively orders you, no thank you, to commit a violent act, which we see this in extremist groups such as KKK. However, there's also the case of libel and defamation, where we also have direct harm, because the offensive lies told about you directly harm your ability to work, your ability to function in your family, your yes, harms sir. your reputation, no thank you. Now, how does speech indirectly lead to violence and harm? Well, even if the speech doesn't directly tell you to, doesn't directly tell you to attack a group, it can advocate extreme views against that group. We see that, in fact, it shapes your perception of the audience towards that group. It portrays them as inferior, sir. no thank you, and more importantly, as a threat. We give you the example where representatives of the Golden Dawn uh, convince their audience that immigrants are dirty, that immigrants are thieves and criminals who are already attacking you. That is, and that is intended to and does in practice point, lead sir. to further violence, no thank you, to further violence and abuse, which unfortunately happens on a daily basis in Greece. But even if that doesn't occur, even if we don't have this violence, we accept that not all people will start beating up immigrants. However, there is still harm. And how will this happen? Well, it leads to those being verbally attacked feeling unsafe. It leads to those significantly compromising their ability to function in as equal members of society. We have the following problem with this. Well, you don't only have the right to be safe, but also the right to feel safe. The feeling of unsafety is that these groups may in time also react in one of the following ways. The community may, in fact, A, B, being under attack, may retreat into themselves, may form close communities, which is what happens with Muslims in the UK, in the small communities. We also have that this marginalization, in fact, undermines the capacity of society to function, ladies and gentlemen, and we believe that this is quite harmful. And also on an individual level, this feeling of insecurity makes the person limit their own characteristics with, with which they identify. We see this with homosexuals who are forced many times not to be able to say that they are homosexual, that not in fear of being persecuted and being up, beaten up by the Golden Dawn. We see that these are incredible harms to the individual and we believe that this can't be justified in order to protect the right of others to publicly demonize them, ladies and gentlemen. And so, ladies and gentlemen, because we believe that freedom of speech needs to be protected and not abused, we are here proposing this motion. Thank you. All right. Thank you, honorable judges, friends of both sides of the table, dear audience. This party of the House would not impose any restrictions on freedom of speech because we believe that our measure would uh, incur little cost but have tremendous opportunities. I will prove it to you by showing how it is the moral obligation of the government to implement the model that we propose. But before I do that, I will indulge in some rebuttal. And I will rebuttal th uh, six main points brought up by team opposition. First of all, I would like to point out the fact that there are currently restrictions and yet we see every day occasions of hate speech. So we don't see how imposing more would solve the problem. And secondly, uh, they, they never pointed out what restrictions they would impose, and even though we asked them that in a POI, they claim that they would uh, restrict everything that imposes direct harm, and we think that that is a very vague answer. For example, I might be uh, insulted when someone criticizes my egg, for example. I don't see how uh, there should be a, a restriction on criticizing uh -huh. people's eggs. No, thank you. So the second point is that they claim that uh, Golden Dawn got a big percentage in the elections because of the right of free speech. However, that is not the case, no thank you. But there are other factors involved, 
such as uh, old people and uh, immigration and all other sort of factors such as economic recession, which have nothing to do with free speech. Third point, uh, they claim that imposing restrictions actually protected people. But we think this is an only a short-term solution and that in the long run it creates people without critical thinking who are not able to think for themselves and uh, they Madam. are sim no, no, thank you, but they simple stay stable and apathetic. Fourth point, they made a false analogy between driving and uh, free speech. No, thank you, but we, we don't see any correlation between the two because in the case of the car, there's direct physical harm, whereas in, in the case of free speech, there's no harm and on the contrary, as I, we have proved, and just a second, sir, on the contrary, there is benefit. Yes, sir. Well, the incitement of violence is direct harm. Telling someone to kill someone else is direct harm. I, I will, in uh, a very short while, show you that, in fact, our measure decreases violence. Uh, and I will be finishing with a rebuttal by showing that uh, the blame, when there are such occasions of violence, does not lie with the person who speaks, but with the one who acts and who reacts violently. And it is them who ought to control and to tame their anger and their instincts. And therefore, it is their fault if they react violently. And the final point I would like to rebuttal is that the claim that the ma minorities are harmed and isolated. But we don't see how this is the case in, for example, in Muslim countries where after the, the depiction of the, the video concerning Muhammad, we saw Muslims in every country reacting violently, in which case that minority was in no way isolated. And I will now be moving on with my constructive case. Madam. No, thank you. First of all, we believe that in the long run, it, it is the moral obligation to imp not to impose restrictions because it will decrease violence because of two reasons. On that point, Mr. No, thank you. First of all, when some controversial ideas are expressed nowadays, there's all this hype and all these reactions, even violence at some times, because we are not used to it and because it is forbidden and there are restrictions. No, thank you. However, if there were no restrictions, we would actually get used to it and we, wouldn't, we would start to accept it and therefore finally stop rea reacting with riots and violent ways. And the second way with which we decrease violence with the model that we propose is by shifting responsibility. Right now, when, when there are restrictions, the responsibility lies between the one who talks and the one who acts violently, which means that the person, that the, the latter person who uh, reacts violently is more likely to act Adam. in that way, no thank you, because he doesn't fear as much. He feels that the blame will be shared and that therefore he has not as much to lose. On the contrary, when there are no restrictions, the responsibility lies only in the one who acts, not the one who talks. And therefore, that person who might react violently would be less inclined to act and would think more of the consequences of his actions and therefore, we believe that in the long run, it, this, the, the measure we propose would lead to the decrease of violence. Secondly, it is the moral obligation of the government because we believe that our measure leads and helps evolution in the long run. In the dark ages, people impose restrictions because they believe that we, we know everything and that there is nothing more that we can acquire. However, in the 21st century, Anna. ladies and gentlemen, we are not, no thank you, arrogant enough to believe that we are perfect, that we have that perfect point. knowledge, no thank you, and a perfect moral compass. On the contrary, we are certain that we can know nothing, absolutely. And therefore, we are also sure that the morals change all the time, and that they differ according to the time or the place. And therefore, we think that challenging something which is, at the, at, at, which is not restricted would lead that no, thank you, to new ideas arising and thus to the evolution of human species and which we think is a positive and, in fact, essential challenge. On the contrary, when, oh, there, is no when, there, are, no, thank you, when there are restrictions, we can see no change whatsoever, no moving forward. We are just staying stable. The third point I would like to mention is that we do not want a state which functions as a parent to a three-year-old. We want a state that helps people become standalone agents. On that point? No, thank you. We live in the ages of information, where people actually live alone, the majority of them, and when life is hard, the, time, the times have changed, and survival has become hard. And therefore, it is the government's duty at such times not to guide and run behind and protect people, but rather than that, to actually help them develop their own critical thinking and to let them grow and think on their own. That is a basic requirement for survival in our, those times. And I would also, no thank you, um, like to point out that we live in the era of the internet when people are exposed to such an amount of stimuli that they need to learn to, to criticize and to actually 
and acquire knowledge as they want, as they choose. And therefore, we believe that, that the, the, the model we propose would help them develop their own thinking. And finally, we strongly believe that the government has a, a moral hazard to not impose uh, restrictions. We do not want a government who is afraid to tackle the real problem and who takes the easy way out, but who actually does not, is not afraid of people of, who are think, who think and who criticize, but actually embraces those people for the evolution of, of human species. Therefore, team uh, government has shown to you that it is it's the government's moral obligation for the decrease of violence, for the evolution of humans, and uh, in order to uh, prevent moral hazards and not to take the easy way out, to actually implement this measure. And for all those reasons, we beg to propose it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, what side proposition is telling us today is that right now there exists harm directly caused by free speech. And what they want to do is to completely alleviate any kind of restriction of free speech in the hope that in some magical land in the future, Golden Dawn's rhetoric inciting people to kill immigrants will cause people to think critically. We told you very specifically that speech can be harmful. It can be harmful in specific contexts and can be harmful when you're saying things in specific ways. What we heard to that is that maybe someday in the future things will get better because people are smart and people are educated. On this side of the house, we think that freedom of speech is a right that needs to be protected and not abused. And Andreas already talked to you about how we do have the duty to protect freedom of speech how those restrictions prevent the harm that is happening right now. I will be talking to you about how this undermines public discourse in general. And these are the three main reasons why we think that there should be restrictions on freedom of speech. But before I talk to you about my constructive case, let me rebut what we heard so far from Team Proposition. Now we heard that the law does not deter people, and we heard that these people do it anyway. We tell you that firstly, this kind of law that does not allow you to publish something or say something publicly will deter you because simply you can't. Secondly, no thank you madam, secondly we tell you that even if it doesn't deter you, it does have the responsibility to punish you later. It does have the responsibility to punish you for inciting violence and leading to, the, to hurt to other people. Thirdly, we tell you that what? Just because some people do not care for the law, we will have no laws at all because we don't think that they can be deterred. We think that lo that logic does not stand. Then we heard that tension will not be diffused because people will hold on to these ideas. We tell you that tension realistically and in society is caused when I say something against you and you say something because you heard me. And that is how tension occurs. That is how physical harm is occurs. Now, now, thank you, madam. That is how I feel threatened. Not when you have an idea in your head. And then we heard about how people think critically and they become more educated in the long term and how we will have no more golden ages. We tell you that is very easy to say in a place like this. It's very easy to say that people can think critically and judge other people's opinions when you're talking to a crowd of educated people who have learned how to think critically. We know that that is not the case all over the world. We know that, how do we know that? Because harm is caused, because if people could critically assess what Golden Dawn is saying, they wouldn't be acting upon its order. And then we tell you what I already talked to you about, uh, about in my introduction, that the fact of the matter is that maybe we can think critically, but when somebody tells me that that person is threatening me, that person is taking my job, I will be incited to act violently. And then we heard that we have a very vague definition about what we think should be restricted or not. Very clearly, we are not proposition, ladies and gentlemen. We are not the ones who have to tell you exactly what should be restricted or not. What we're telling you is that yes, harm is caused, and yes, restrictions should exist. And then we heard, no thank you, madam. 
and then we heard about how people reacted violently to the video and that social media give more power to, uh, to those people speaking uh, violently and inciting violence. And for some reason, because of that, we must allow them to speak violently when they have more power and then when they can affect more people and when they may have an audience talking to, Point which madam. is on the other side of the world. Okay. And then we heard also, which will lead me to my argument, how, uh, well, Pakistani people are an illegal minority. What we don't understand is what? Do we not care about minorities? On this side of the house, we're telling you that freedom of speech should not be restricted. It should be for everyone. But unlimited freedom of speech hinders exactly that. And it, con and it reduces it to a privilege for the people who are forceful and who have numbers. Now, about how it undermines public discourse. Essentially, this argument is a bit counterintuitive, so bear with me for a second. Okay, what we're saying is that when you have unlimited freedom of speech, what happens is that you're undermining the reality of what freedom of speech is. Because we know that a right is meaningful to me personally as an individual, not when it is written on a piece of paper, not when it is an abstract idea written on a constitution, but when I can practically exercise it in my life. If I have the human right, I'll take in a moment, Adam. If I have the human right to sustenance and food, and I have no money to eat, then that right, the fact that somebody allows me and tells me that I should eat, does not mean anything to me. Before I continue, yes. Madam, your point proves that you consider some opinions to be superior than others, so you give the right to some people that can use the right, actually. Some okay. are better. Than we think that, yes, maybe opinions are not hurtful in themselves. What we're saying is that if you express an opinion in a particular way that tells you and leads you to harm people, that is harmful, and we wouldn't like that in society. If you want Richard Dawkins to speak to an educated audience about how bad Christianity is, yes, go ahead and do that. But if you want some crazy atheist to speak about it in an audience full of Christians, we're not okay with that. We're not okay with harming people. So. We're saying that the government exactly provides a minimal framework on context for exercising those rights. And we're saying that freedom of speech is meaningful in a social context, not when it is just an opinion in your head. We're saying that when we talk about freedom of speech, we're talking about freedom of public speech. So by, an, by, unlimiting, by not limiting the freedom of speech, you're harming the ability of some people to act because these people feel threatened and they feel marginalized and they feel like they're being under attack. So the social fabric breaks down and the social context in which freedom of speech is meaningful breaks down. And secondly, we tell you that that leads to harming public discourse because we tell you that firstly, you have, by, you have less people talking. Therefore, you have less pluralism. You have less of that kind of things that make conversation, that make conversation pro productive and fruitful. And secondly, we tell you that the people who are not talking are the ones that have a counterclaim to the forceful ideas of a majority that, it, that is attacking them. And you're not allowing them to give that counterclaim. So ladies and gentlemen, because at the end of the day, freedom of speech should not be abused. It should be protected. And because we believe in that, we would most definitely restrict it. We're so proud to oppose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of this house, abuse implies that we, what the model the government is proposing is not transparent. But ladies and gentlemen, we have abuse when you don't have specific uh, regulations on freedom of speech. When you leave something vague, that is abuse. When you leave something free, that is transparency. And transparency, ladies and gentlemen, is what the government is actually supporting. Now, let's take a look to what three categories of the, uh, of the arguments of the opposition. First of all, the duty to protect. Second of all, the harms that, if we leave freedom of speech uh, unregulated, ha happen. And thirdly, how it undermines public discourse. But ladies and gentlemen, before moving on and uh, uh, explaining uh, and rebutting those points, please let me clarify some misunderstandings. The opposition seems to think that we live in a magical land in the future where everything happens long term. Ladies and gentlemen, our public is not stupid. 
That is undermining the public, ladies and gentlemen. We are talking about adults who are Adam. educated. No, thank you. And even if they're not educated, they, uh, uh, the only way to tackle problems and for society to understand problems is to tackle them openly. So even if there's no education in which, no, thank you, we, we answer there is, well, only if where there's discussion, ladies and gentlemen, you can actually be educating. When there's opposition to everything that is on said that on freedom of speech. No, thank you. Now, uh, third, second of all, they told us that their model actually deters, ladies and gentlemen. No, it is not deterred. Oh, because was, no, thank you. It will still happen under the table. Madam. This is a social problem, as the second speaker of opposition actually stated, and what is a social problem, it has had to be addressed by society. Doing it under the table doesn't that mean that it will stop existing. No, thank you. They also brought this example about Golden Dawn, ladies and gentlemen. And if people, and they get harmed when they hear what Golden Dawn has to say. Well, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, if they're supporting that Golden Dawn is bad, that's on our side, ladies and gentlemen, because what Golden Dawn actually wants to do is restrict freedom of speech, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, only when it, uh, there is an opposition to Golden Dawn, people can actually understand why what Golden Dawn is supporting is bad. So even if there's no education, that does not Madam. stand. No, thank you. Now, let's move on to the categories brought up by team opposition. On that no, thank you. Duty to protect, ladies and gentlemen. We had three main arguments under this category. First of all, how it is our duty of the government to actually protect the vulnerable, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, we feel that it's the duty of the government to create critical beings that have critical thinking, ladies and gentlemen, and can, that can think for themselves and have an opinion of their own. What is happening... So let's take an, uh, an example, Asian, a very simple point, example. Yeah. No, thank you. The public knows that murder, rape, and stealing is bad. So this should happen to hate speech as well, ladies and gentlemen. There is no restriction on making plays about murders, ladies and gentlemen. Edgar Allan Edgar Allan Poe, was. I believe everybody's familiar with him, ladies and gentlemen. So in the same context, hate speech should actually not be on restricted. No, thank you. There should be an opposition, and society should understand that hate speech is bad. Now. They talked about, they brought this example about how cars, ladies and gentlemen, and we have cars and we regulate the speed in order to prevent an accident. On that point, well, ladies and gentlemen, no, thank you. In the status quo today, there are still violations where there are restrictions. What we want, ladies and gentlemen, is the example of a knife. You have to learn to use the knife and not cut your hand, ladies and gentlemen. It is a tool. It can actually help you, but you should not, point, no, thank you. You should learn how to use it properly, and you should learn to think through that and exercise that right. Now, they also talked about abuse, ladies and gentlemen. Stating his opinion is not abuse, ladies and gentlemen. Insults oh, are subject, no thank you, to interpretation, ladies and gentlemen. If insults are subject to interpretation, and we have an opposition here today that has not clarified what these regulations and what these restrictions are, we feel that that is abuse. Now, moving on to the, second ca no, thank you, to, the third ca to the second category, harms, ladies and gentlemen. We, they, heard, they had two arguments under this category how there's violence caused directly when preaching about it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we do not have a five-year-old audience, ladies and gentlemen. We all know but when somebody On tells you to jump off a cliff in a moment, madam, you don't jump off a cliff, ladies and gentlemen, because you know that jumping off a cliff is bad, don't you be? If the people of Greece were so educated, why is it that the ratings of Golden Dawn actually increased while they were speaking Violence thank you, thank you, madam. Ladies and gentlemen, because there's a huge economic crisis in Greece. The causation doesn't, uh, correlation doesn't imply causation, ladies and gentlemen. Simply because it is rise, it does not imply that it's direct link in freedom of speech, ladies and gentlemen. It's about an economic crisis. It's about frustration for the other political parties. And this, de this debate is not about that. Now, also, under the category of harms, they talked about violence being directly, uh, indirectly harmful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we do not feel that we should restrict our civil rights simply because we are afraid that somebody might be insulted and cause violence. We have laws that say that violence and the responsibility lies with the action, ladies and gentlemen, not Madam. of the freedom of speech. Now, moving on to the last category, ladies and gentlemen, that the undermines the public discourage, ladies and gentlemen. They were talking about how um, if it's a, in a social content, context, ladies and gentlemen, then uh, freedom of speech is allowed. Well, I feel that anything can be in a social context, ladies and gentlemen, and anything can be heard. Well, let's take an example. 
Dawkins can, call, can talk about uh, Muslims in a bad way, but not an atheist can't. Well, I fail to see how this uh, nice uh, extension of the case of opposition actually stands, ladies and gentlemen, because we're standing for equality, ladies and gentlemen. We're standing for our civil rights. We have failed to see why the opposition seems to believe that regulating vaguely is going to solve the problems of violence when the laws are not being upheld. Let's enforce the laws and let people critical thinking, let people critical think what and what they should hear, what they should not, what is good and what is bad, because morality is in every single one of, uh, in every single one, uh, of us, ladies and gentlemen, every single individual. And, in only, and the only way we can tackle those problems if, if it is in the open, ladies and gentlemen, if there's an opposition to a bad thing of freedom of speech, if there's an opposition to bad uh, problems that happen in society. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, apparently the gay couple walking down the street of say de Lay Monam can fend off not the physical abuse, but just the constant harassment from say members of Golden Dawn through their education. They can throw books at them and prove to them through logical arguments why they have equal rights to the members of Golden Dawn before they get beaten up or try to run away. We really don't think that side proposition has painted a clear picture of the cases we mean when we would say we'd tolerate restrictions on the freedom of speech and they just proposed anyone being able to say whatever we like because we don't want the state holding our hand. We're not holding the hand of the people talking. We're holding the hand of the people who feel oppressed in their everyday life. We're holding the hand of the people who can't express their opinion in fear of retaliation.